This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 632, recorded on June 26th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And Chuck Knirsch. Hi, folks. Chuck, someone wrote in and said, who's that ghost in the background? (laughs) (laughs) Is it not a ghost? I introduce him every time. (laughs) Not not a ghost. (laughs) Chuck Knirsch is a member of Parasites Without Border and a clinical researcher at MD. Yes. And uh, highly expert, so that's why we have him here. And he's a good friend of Daniel's as well. Yeah, so passionate about international health and writing about it and teaching 25 years. Yeah, and he was on TWIP, which is, of course, the greatest uh, qualification. <laughs> God, <laughs> Just joking. All right, Daniel, how's things going this week? Uh, so things are going well in the New York area. Um, at some point, we'll talk about how they're going in other areas. But let me get going. I I know you know Vincent shared with me. You know there there are people that just w- sort of want us to get like straight to it and get to the meat of it. So let's do that. So uh, first, I'll start off with my um, my quotation to set the tone. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And that was Charles Dickens, um, A Tale of Two Cities. He was actually describing the COVID pandemic um, a little bit before it actually happened. Um, (laughs) It's good. <laughs> but no, I think there was a lot in there. I mean, when this, when, you know, I, I remember very well, I think people have a short attention span or some people do, but I remember very well just a few months ago when I was sort of beside myself with, you know, what I referred to at the time as the kitchen sink approach. Let's just try everything and hope something sticks and hope we don't kill everyone in the process. Um, but we are, we are making a lot of progress. So um, I will start off with my review of current management where I'm going to basically go through everything, but hitting what we now know. And we have, we have learned a lot. I recently did an interview um, where, you know, people have gotten a little frustrated. We had this big shutdown, you know, um, actually, I, I think, Vincent, you expressed a little frustration on the most recent <laughs> twist about like, we had all this time. What did we do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, we did some stuff. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to go through from soup to nuts um, about how to approach COVID and, and what we now know, because this is not what we were doing back in back in March. Um, so the first is the really critical thing we've learned about um, with testing. Um Number one is we actually have tests. Um, there was the recent uh, frontline special, the virus, um, what went wrong. And, um, you know, my biggest frustration back in February when we were seeing what we now realize was clear community spread in the New York area, we had we had no tests. We had this very sort of circular, well, if they haven't come from Wuhan, we're not testing them because we're only seeing positive tests in people from Wuhan. And we're like, you're only testing people from Wuhan. So tautology. Um, but we ramped up. We now have a lot of testing, um, not as much, nowhere close to as much as we need. But this is key to the whole Tetris that we all talk about. So the testing, the tracing, the isolating, the whole contact approach to opening back up. Um, And just to let people know, there has been such a surge in the southern part of our country that we are having issues with access to um, swabs and the reagents we need to do the testing. Hmm. Um, So this is a problem. I know there's always been this, anyone who wants a test can get one. Yeah, if you're willing to wait, on getting the test, and if you're now, if you're willing to wait on those results. So, even in even in our hospitals, we're having unless we really prioritize it a 24 hour turnaround. So, um, this is a problem. We we we, we are still not there. Um, our organization just bought a machine that can do um, another thousand tests per day. That's not that's not enough. Uh, we need mm. lots of those. Um, 
testing is critical and also the public, you know, people who listen. This is mostly clinicians. Or I say a lot of clinicians that I encourage to listen, but a lot of uh, people who've been longtime TWIV listeners and new TWIV listeners are not. Um, we need to change that mentality. If you think you've got COVID-19, um, let's find out so that we can um, stop the spread. Um, what do we do once we find out someone has COVID-19? Um, there's actually a lot we can do. We now understand a lot about the clinical course. Um, so as as far as um, what do we do, we can follow up with our patients. Um, we can perform a repeat outpatient evaluation either in person or we can do it um, through telehealth, which is, um, I think, here to stay. Um, detailed history with a real focus on where we are in the clinical course, what's critical to me is the date of symptom onset so we can identify when that critical second week is going to occur so we have the timing of the different complications um, and we've been through this a few times but that second week is when we see the respiratory um, issues followed by a lot of our clotting issues during week three and then we watch for week four for this sort of post viral um infection, bacterial uh, super infection phase. Um, there's a lot we can do. Um, I think, Vincent, you asked last time about pulse oximeters, um, mm -hmm. but we, we recommend, um, you know, now that you can get pulse oximeters, they're about $30 um, that you can buy these. Um, that's $30 well spent. Um, but what we've seen is as you get close to that second week, people who start to have their level of oxygen drop into the 80s are higher risk that can be followed the next by day by an increase in respiratory rate um, and then this is sort of the frightening within 24 hours the people who will decompensate um, can decompensate can basically need hospital level care so that pulse oximeter that keeping in touch with patients counting that respiratory rate which you can actually do just looking at someone over a, a, a zoom call or a telemedicine visit um, we don't really know what labs are so critical at this point, um, but we're still learning a bit about um, complete blood counts with differentials so we can calculate that neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Um, people whose neutrophils go up and lymphocytes go down, um, we've seen that they're a higher risk of um, poor outcomes. Um, D-dimer, this is something we've talked about for a while. Um, these people are at increased risk of doing poorly, but we also think that ties in with an increased risk of thromboembolic complications. Um, IL-6 levels, there's a bit of data on that helping us. Chest X-ray, and this is going to tie in. Um, what we're doing with the chest X-ray is not so much diagnosis, but we're trying to get a sense of which small subset of patients might need antibiotics. There's a very limited role of antibiotics, only about 10% of patients, right? We now have a lot of experience. Millions of people have been infected. Only about 10% of patients have a sec secondary bacterial infection. So if you're using antibiotics or you're receiving antibiotics, um, more than 10% of the COVID-19 cases, you're overusing those antibiotics. So um, we often see people show up in the hospital. They've got their augmentin, their doxycycline, their minocycline, their azithromycin, um, whatever else. Um, be careful with those because we've seen a lot of um, antibiotic associated diarrhea get admitted to the hospital. So the Clostridium difficile. So, you know, make, make a careful decision. We're starting to recommend against um, drawing a lot of procalcitonins. This is a um, inflammatory marker that a lot of uh, people and clinicians associate with bacterial infections. That goes up in COVID-19. So an elevated procalcitonin may encourage you to use, procal use antibiotics. Don't. Um, this is part of the disease. Doesn't tell you that there's a bacterial infection. Look at sputums. Look at chest x-rays. Do that detailed physical exam. Um, decision to, to recommend hospitalization, we've now learned um, quite a bit about this clinical course. So I know early on, there was sort of just a mix of practice style. We saw um, young people with no oxygen needs, not much really going on, getting hospitalized just because they had COVID-19. Um, we now have a better sense, as I've talked about, about this follow-up and better deciding who may benefit from hospitalization. Again, it's going to be people who are higher risk, people who have that um, hypoxemia and an oxygen requirement. Um, initial hospital evaluation. 
um, really much like we talked about where you're going to be going through identifying that date of symptom onset so you know where you are, looking at age and comorbidities. That helps us quite a bit. Same, same blood testing that we talked about, uh, that complete blood count with differential to calculate that neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Um, D-dimers, maybe not procalcitonin, chest x-ray, but rarely CAT scans. We don't necessarily need to expose everyone to these people. Um, pulmonary support, and this has been um, exciting because we're starting to see a little bit more of, uh, I'm going to say this with tongue in cheek, a little bit more of low quality evidence helping us <laughs> in this area. Um, low quality evidence is, I guess, better than no evidence, but um, confirming what we were seeing where um, if you keep people off of the ventilators and you use our other tools, high flow oxygen, um, biphasic, so I'll say BiPAP and CPAP. Um, and these are ways of creating pressure, either just one constant continuous positive airway pressure or a biphasic uh, positive airway pressure. These are ways of getting the oxygen up without putting someone on a ventilator. Uh, we talked a little bit about, about proning before, having patients lay on their belly. Um, and then now there's coming out with a little bit of data showing that, yes, this actually may improve outcomes, um, but it also demonstrating that this may also increase the risk to healthcare workers. Um, so some of the hospitals in our area are actually putting up um, extra glass slider doors, trying to create more negative um, pressure rooms so we can provide all these types of pulmonary support, um, and at the same time, keep our staff safe. Um, the antibiotics and antivirals, as mentioned, limited use for antibiotics, but remdesivir has a limited minor role. Okay. Um, trying not to get too unexcited there. Um, mm -hmm. Exciting, the, um, the steroids, the dexamethasone, um, the actual preprint is now out so people can read the whole study. Um, I think I mentioned, I think it's going to take um, some of our um, centers a little while to um, pivot their thinking because of the, the dogma, the dogma anti-steroids that we discussed last time. Um, but now we're actually seeing the full article. It, it, I mean, it, it's very solid, very encouraging. Um, clearly no evidence of harm and looks like a pretty dramatic um, improvement. Uh, some more encouraging news about tocilizumab. I'm going to hit each of those sort of individually, what that is. Um, and then anticoagulation. Um, Thromboembolic complications are very common, and now we're seeing evidence for benefit um, of treating people in hospital and actually for treating people post-hospital discharge out to 45 days. Um, so let's talk a little bit about each one of these in more depth. Pulmonary support. Um, so we we know a bit about proning. We've been talking about that for a while where people are laid down on their belly. And the World Health Organization um, is uh, basically created a, um, a group to provide a living systemic review. So they're going to keep us updated as more data is available, but they published their first update in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, ventilation techniques and risk for transmission of coronavirus disease. Um, and, you know, basically they're, they're giving us some support to um, the idea that non-invasive ventilation, um, and they say probably reduces mortality, um, but may increase the risk of transmission. So that's nice to be getting some, um, some data out there. Um, the steroids we mentioned um, quite a bit last time. Um, and actually, there has been such an uptake um, of the dexamethasone, of the steroids, that now it's actually hard to get dexamethasone in our country. So we have shortages. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the 35% uh, mortality, 28-day mortality reduction in patients requiring mechanical ventilation and a 20% reduction in patients with hypoxemia. So anyone requiring oxygen. Um, no benefit, as I think we've sort of suspected in first week in patients without disease that makes them require oxygen. So then you could probably you could probably substitute other steroid equivalents, right? Saw your mandrel, saw your cortip if you're running low on dexamethasone. Yeah, and I actually in my in my consults, I sort of give a layout of what would be the equivalents of other steroids. So dexamethasone, um, we have our 
glucocorticoids or mineral corticoids. There's several different steroids. Um, dexamethasone of six milligrams is um, probably equivalent to about 30, 32 milligrams of solumedrol or about 40 milligrams of prednisone. So you don't need necessarily dexamethasone, we don't think, um, but that was the study drug. So um, at least at our centers, we're, I'm a big fan of whatever was studied. Let's, let's try to use that um, if we can. But I think that um, people were seeing, I think, similar benefits to the other steroids that they were using. Um, and actually some of the, um, some of the stuff out of China that came out early after the Lancet piece where they said, you know, I don't know about that opinion piece on don't use steroids because we're using them and they seem to help. Um, they were not all done with dexamethasone. It was actually solumedrol in some mm -hmm. of those studies. I was told by an endocrinologist today that there is differences in salt retention, but otherwise the, you know, when you make the adjustments that you get the anti-inflammatory, you know, effect that you want by adjusting as you just laid out. Yeah, actually, that's good. I think we'll take a little little side little sidebar here. Um, yeah, so we break down some of our steroids into the glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid activity, and the glucocorticoid we think of as being um, mainly the anti-inflammatory um, aspect, and the mineral corticoid is that salt fluid retention part. Um, so yeah, there there's. Um, you know, there's going to be a little variation here. It'll be interesting to see if it's significant enough that it, one steroid is better than another. Um, maybe those will be some of the next trials. Hmm. The nice thing I like about dexamethasone or prednisone, or these are inexpensive um, therapies. I, I did an analysis with the the Fimric, um, one of the prior managers, about you know with the number needed to treat out of the study, how much would it cost us per life saved in sub-Saharan Africa, in Uganda, based upon current um, pharmacy prices, about five dollars per life saved. Hmm. So this this is the kind of stuff you want. You don't want like. Well, let's say interventions that are out of the reach of the people that need them the most. Tocilizumab would be out of reach, probably. <clears throat> yeah. Like so, <laughs> yeah. So, what are the encouraging news about tocilizumab? Um, so, tocilizumab treatment for cytokine release syndrome in hospitalized COVID nineteen patients survival and clinical outcomes. Uh, this was uh, accepted into chest. Um, and this was basically the observational study of the patients up at Yale, and it was 239 patients. Um, and they they basically look at how they were doing before, but then they show us how they do after they instituted a protocol whereby they, they give steroids um, and then tocilizumab. And uh, they had an impressive 75% uh, survival for patients on ventilators. Um, so you can sort of think about what you've been hearing about how well people usually do on ventilators and a 93% survival for patients not on ventilators. Um, so that was, you know, an impressive um, uh, outcome based upon them sort of embracing the steroids tocilizumab approach. But we'll hear from recovery an actual proper um, randomized controlled placebo arm trial, and we'll also hear the, about the French data. Um, but this was this was quite impressive and sort of similar to the improved survival we saw. And maybe more interesting, um, I found, was that it actually looked like the African American patients um, and the Hispanic patients did even better. Were even um, doing better with these treatments than the Caucasian population. And historically, without these interventions, um, their, their chance of death has been about twice of that of the Caucasian. So interesting, it may be, and this will be something to think about when we get the recovery data, um, is, are different therapies more or less effective in different genetic backgrounds? Mm-hmm. A uh, couple updates on anticoagulation, and and I, I don't want to underplay this. I mean, anticoagulation. Um, what are virologists and ID do docs talking about anticoagulation for? Um, mm -hmm. But we realized early on that, and I think I've said about half of our um, patients in the hospital, particularly the critically ill patients, were developing thromboembolic complications. Um, so there are a couple studies that that just came out. One was right here at Northwell, um, and it was a um, sort of a reanalysis of um, the Mariner data. This is a large uh, thromboembolic um, data observation where they were looking at major thrombotic events um, over the 45 days post-hospitalizations. These patients were admitted um, 
ended up out there and about a 28% reduction in major thrombotic events um, using a, a medicine, um, Zarelto. And uh, I'm going to give you the, the brand name because I, I have trouble pronouncing Revoxaraban. <laughs> which I probably did wrong. Um, and then there was one, actually, an observational study specifically. This is the Mount Sinai data. And this was the an observational study association of treatment dose anticoagulation um, with in-hospital survival among hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And this was 2,773 patients at Mount Sinai. Um, and basically, if you looked at patients requiring mechanical ventilation, um, there was a mortality of 62.7 with no anticoagulation, 29.1 with full anticoagulation. So um, cutting that, you know, more than in half just by using full dose anticoagulation um, and a very low risk of bleeding was reported. So um, still a bunch of pressing questions, you know, so, um, you know, when patients get admitted, should they all get anticoagulation um, or not? Should it be at these higher doses or just prophylactic doses? When they go home, what's the best thing to give them when they go home? Um, and then there, there actually is a study going on right now. I'm very curious to see the results from. Um, actually, it was by um, the first author in the um, in the the Mariner data reanalysis. And this is patients who never get sick enough to go into the hospital because we see strokes and clots and issues there, um, trying to look at what is the best approach for them. Um, and then I'll, I'll just finish on the last note is um, sort of a little disturbing, just came out in the, um, the MMWR. So that's the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report and just came out. It, it has the publication date of June 26, which is, um, you know, going to be after this is being recorded. <laughs> so, but it's already out. I already have access to it. Um, and it's volume nine, number 25. And it was looking at women of reproductive age. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, ho hopefully this is not going to be true, but uh, they were actually showing that pregnant women were significantly more likely to require hospitalization should they be infected with COVID-19. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a pretty large. I mean, they, they looked at over 300,000 women of reproductive age. Um, they didn't have data on everyone, which I have to say. They had pregnancy status available on um, about a third of these women, so about 91,000 actual. And then they looked at it and actually, unfortunately, it looked like pregnant women had a higher um, incidence of hospitalization and also uh, more likely to be admitted to the intensive care unit. So, um, so far, I hadn't really seen a signal in pregnant women, and, and I was reassured as time went by and we didn't see that. But this is the first um, report I've seen that maybe pregnant women um, are at uh, significantly more risk than their non-pregnant counterparts. But not for death, though. That's a good thing from this study, right? Yeah, actually, um, you know, they they were they were not you know and I have to say there was not a significant number of deaths in in pregnant women they um, yeah. they're more likely to be hospitalized increased risk for ICU admission but yeah that's so you mentioned earlier that you know in the south the number of cases are going up substantially do you expect now those some to be imported into the New York area and and result in a in an uptick. You know, we were starting to see what I was referring to, I think, last time is the back door is wide open. Um, yep. And um, what was happening is the snowbirds were returning from Florida, Texas, Arizona. I mean, a lot of people in New York, it gets cold here. And um, <laughs> particularly if you're an older individual and have the ability, you might go spend the winter down in Florida and then come back in the summer. Um, so we were starting to see that. Actually, Wednesday, um, the governor created a 14-day quarantine for people returning. Um, mm. So if you come back from one of those hot zones, and it's defined as you know a, a, a incidence or prevalence above a certain level, um, then you are required to do 14 days of home quarantine before you're allowed to enter the general population. Um, and pretty stiff fines, like $2,000 first time you're caught, $5,000 mm. second time, $10,000 if you spread the virus to someone. So. Um, so, you know, what I think has happened is people are now driving <laughs> back to New York with New York license plates, so they don't know. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, that was what I was, yeah. Some of the New England states have had that. So Vermont, if you want to enter Vermont, you have to do a 14-day quarantine. And they have reciprocity with Maine and New Hampshire, even though there are cases upticking in Maine. You know, when you started with the tale of two cities, I thought maybe you're going to allude to New York and Houston. You know, Houston's becoming 
what New York looked like a couple months ago. And our, our friend Peter Hotez has been now talking about sort of the parabolic rise in cases, um, which is quite concerning if they're going to, you know, exceed their ICU capacity, et cetera, in Houston right now. Yeah, I've been I've been watching. Uh, Peter's very active on social media. I don't know if our listeners know Peter Hotez, but um, he he very active, and he's been pointing out for a while that this really is sort of a rocket trajectory to um, out of control down there in Texas. And um, yeah, it you know people have talked about waves and everything else, um, and and I know people have said we're, we're still in the first wave. What what it, it didn't go away, and if anything. We had reached a peak in our country um, of about thirty-eight thousand as sort of a single-day high. We're we're back at that again, um, and so yeah, I I think that you know I'm still hoping that the virus's ability to spread better indoors, as or I should say, the reverse of that, its inability to spread well outdoors may save us. We we haven't seen a huge uptick after a lot of the uh, protests. But um, we are seeing a big uptick in areas that have gotten so hot that everyone's indoors together in the air conditioning. Um, so I'm hoping that we have sort of a flat summer, um, but we're already seeing um, we're already seeing a rise in local cases. Um, I'm just Peter, Daniel that you know from you know, your you know you know the expert experience and now that some of the object you know the case series are being published and the randomized controlled trials that if you don't exceed the ICU capacity or the hospital capacity, care will be better now. I, I, you know, I have to say, I, you know, I am optimistic because I think we have learned a lot. Um, right. And the mortality, you know, if you get COVID now, your chance of survival is much better than it was if you got COVID in March. We know what not to give. That's number one. And we actually have learned quite a bit about what to give and when, when to worry about you, when you might need hospital level care. And we can do all this as long as we don't get over capacity. So, you know, right now we're in good shape as far as our ability to deliver care. This uh, gentleman that I described who came up from Florida, I mean, it was very straightforward, very calm. You know, he came in, um, he escalated to the Venturi mask. He was started on steroids. Um, he was worsening. We, we followed this up with tocilizumab. He was on full dose anticoagulation um, the whole time. Um, and uh, now we're we're just looking at um, discharge on you know four liters of nasal cannula. Um, it was all very calm, all very systematic. Um, you know, such a different experience than um, early on. Well, I I don't doubt that you have learned things. My question is, not every hospital will have learned things. Are they going to learn from your experience and others in these high numbers areas where you've been able to do this? I think that's a challenge. Um, I mean, and and I, this is probably, I was actually thinking we would talk about this next time, but I'll, I'll jump in with it now, is is how do doctors decide um, what to do? How do they, how do they come up with um, the way they practice? Um, you know, it, it had one point been, you know, you learn what you're going to learn in medical school and residency, and that's what you do forever. Um, but then we started having um, the introduction of evidence-based medicine, right? And I think I've described that w during my training, it was still actually controversial, if you could imagine, that you would use evidence to guide your practice, um, that you would dare use evidence over, you know, the eminence-based uh, practice of medicine that had had been what had happened for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, but it takes a little while. So I talked about the the data just came out on dexamethasone and the studies there, you can sit down, you can, you know, make some time in your day and look through it and decide as a clinician, um, does this make sense to you? And, and hopefully infectious disease doctors that are guiding patient care, take the time, read through it. But it's interesting. It takes a little bit of time. There's almost like a, an inertia to what we've been doing before it changes. And maybe the first thing starts to happen is you see a gradual change in a particular um, institution. Um, and then you start seeing um, guidance um, and graded guidance where there are um, certain groups. And I, I talked about the group that the WHO had formed regarding um, pulmonary support. So now you start getting guidance. You start setting guidance coming out. Sometimes that guidance is occurring at a local level, at a different health system. And those people putting out the guidance are not necessarily trained in how to do this guidance. So there can be a little bit of a delay, unfortunately, before something goes from um, good evidence 
to actually um, a properly graded guideline that helps um, people um, take care of patients. My hope, you know, and maybe someone will give us enough money, we'll put an ad in, uh, you know, the national media. But um, my hope is actually people listening to TWIV are learning quite a bit about the New York experience. And hopefully this allows them to do um, a better job in all the different parts of the country that are just seeing now um, what we've been seeing for many, many months. Yeah, we seem to have a lot of physicians listening. I, I know one won't be because he feels we have too much banter. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's a loss, especially you could listen to Daniel's part at least, right? <laughs> I think they could do that. Yeah, hopefully hopefully my part is quick to the point, everything you need to yeah. know. And then, you know, if you want the banter, I enjoy the banter. Then uh, <laughs> it can stay tuned in. Um, yeah, I guess I should say before I close out um, – Thanks to everyone who's been um, going to Parasites Without Borders and uh, helping us support Femric, um, the the Uganda site. Um, it's been actually people have been doing a great job. And you know, you, you take you say, hey, we might be able to save a life for five dollars. Um, uh, as COVID continues to create food insecurity and all kinds of issues in sub-Saharan Africa, thank you for everyone going to ParasitesWithoutBorders dot com, donating, um, and helping us uh, to support that clinic. All right. Uh, we have two two emails for you, Daniel. First from Kathy, uh, who writes, I just wanted to write and thank you for this podcast. While appropriately fearful of the COVID virus as a 70 plus person, I had also been missing the exciting science that always comes with these events. As a very young med tech working at the city hospital with physicians from Fox Chase Cancer Institute, I did hepatitis B agar gel diffusion tests though at that time it had not yet been identified as the hep B virus. Using a double-blind study, we tested pints of blood intended for transfusion, a drop of serum from the donor unit tested against the antigen serum, looking for lines of identity when there was an antigen-antibody reaction. The study was quickly interrupted when all of the transfusion from units of blood with lines of identity caused hepatitis. Heady stuff for a 20-year-old. In the 80s, I had a ringside seat for HIV as I worked in the Red Cross blood program as a lab director. We all learned immunology as we muddled our way through that crisis. You think the COVID testing is problematic? <laughs> you should have seen the lack of specificity that came with the early HIV ELISA tests. Deferring blood donors with a positive ELISA test but negative Western blot ranks right up there with the all-time difficult conversations you can have with a volunteer blood donor. Despite all the headaches that this virus caused, the advances that were made in understanding the immune system were truly am amazing. By the time I retired a few years ago, my experiences included testing for the transfusion transmitted infectious agents, HTLV-1, hepatitis C, Zika virus, and West Nile. I thought I'd seen it all until COVID came along. Finally, to my question, is COVID SARS-2 a transfusion transmitted disease? Thanks again for this excellent podcast. Stay well. I thought you'd enjoy that story, Daniel. And, I, I, uh, I do, also. actually. I think maybe some of our listeners know that I um, I had that personal experience of, of growing up in Greenwich Village in the 80s. Uh, my mother was actually on a panel with um, the now famous Anthony Fauci um, up at New York Hospital as they sort of worked uh, to create relationships between the researchers and the affected population. But, oh, I remember. I remember how difficult mm -hmm. it was in the early days of HIV. Uh, you know, and as pointed out, we're we're still in the middle of the COVID pandemic. You know, we're still in the middle of the HIV pandemic. With that's right, we sure uh, are. So, <laughs> it, it, I think the only difference is how many zeros you know, and how many how many yeah. people have HIV and how many people get COVID every day. So, uh, is COVID SARS two a transfusion transmitted disease? I don't think so. We don't have any. Yeah, answer. we don't have any evidence, and they're they're. Never tends to be any, I'm going to quote, sort of significant um, viremia. That doesn't seem to be um, a yeah. big part of this disease. Okay. It's more spillover, I think, isn't it? That's what we think, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Brian writes, I've, I've been seeing a growing number of stories about COVID-19 patients who have not fully recovered from their illness and are suffering from debilitating fatigue, brain fog, and muscle pain, such as discussed in the article on long haulers in the Atlantic. And uh, what are your thoughts on this? And do you know of these symptoms lingering in any of the patients you have, treat you have treated? 
Yeah, I, I think I've started talking about this the last um, couple of TWIVs, and uh, we're now seeing um, a number of these long haulers. Actually, I'm hoping Mount Sinai actually developed um, a sort of a chronic um, COVID clinic, and I'm going to be careful about the word chronic, um, but we're seeing a number of patients who have a very long duration to their COVID-19 um, symptoms. And, um, you know, they originally they sort of, you know, I signed up for two weeks and I'm sick at eight weeks. And some of these patients do get better, right? So there's a long haul form of COVID where maybe they're sick for eight, nine, 10 weeks, but finally that fever goes away. And then they're sort of left with the fatigue. I don't know when the fatigue goes away. Just, um, I haven't been able to follow these people long enough because, you know, we started seeing them in March and here we are, April, May, June, we're three months out. And I still have patients that are in that lingering fatigue, that burning chest period of time. So we don't know if there will be a, I'll call it a post-viral COVID syndrome um, that has been described for some of our other viral illnesses. Um, but this is something we're seeing. And, and I think, Vincent, you've, you've asked a few times, what percent? Um, I don't know yet, um, but we're, we're definitely seeing this quite often. Okay. All right, Daniel, thank you again. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And hey, I appreciate all the great work you guys are doing. Chuck, thanks a lot. Good talking with you both. And uh, see you both next week. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's sunny and 84 Fahrenheit, which is, well, this says 28, so that would mean it was 82, but... So it's probably 29 Celsius. <laughs> also Who's joining counting? us from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. It's a pleasant day out with puffy little clouds. Uh, it's about, I would guess, 84 degrees centigrade, or Fahrenheit rather. Um, Kathy, what is that Fahrenheit, uh, centigrade? 29. Thank you. <laughs> and Dixon she's our, is, facts, uh, she's our facts checker. <laughs> so I'm pointing, if you're watching the Zoom video, I'm pointing out the window to my left. Dixon's right across the river there. That's right. In fact, you can see me waving to you, Vince. And then Bri uh, Brianne Barker is in Madison, New Jersey. Hi, Brianne. I'm waving Hi. to Brianne too, but she can't She see. is that down yeah. that way. <laughs> yes. And it's That's also right. 84 here. Kathy, of 84. course, is that way also, but farther Way away far away. Yes. <laughs> right because to my right is europe <laughs> and <laughs> just just up north and uh yeah on the other side of the hudson river is alan dove western massachusetts welcome good to be here and it's um 30 degrees celsius 86 fahrenheit here and um actually it's pretty nice day it's not not too bad humidity 27 percent. right uh, it's, it's pleasant uh, so we just bantered, you know, it's for the people yeah. who, who, for whom bantering bugs them. And I get emails all the time, which you never hear because <laughs> no. they drive me crazy. We're, I'm sorry. You know what someone told me? Do you know this guy, Joe Rogan? Have you heard of him? I've mm -hmm. heard of him. So he's apparently has the most popular podcast in the world. And some of his shows I go- I believe that. No? <laughs> no. Right. That's what he says. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he, he um, some of his shows are three hours. Three hours. Uh, Dixon, he interviewed Peter Hotez. I, really? Yeah. And someone said he just interviewed a, a someone who said the, the virus came from a lab in China. And, and they said, you should, you guys should go on. And I'm not going to give him our expertise. The hell with that. We know the lab space. didn't come. The virus didn't come from a lab. It came from a bat. And that's the end of that. If you think otherwise, you're, you're just misled and foolish. Okay. Move on to more important things. And we like to banter because we're friends. And that's, that's what right. we do. And just to show you that scientists are people too. Got it. Right. Well, what we have always said is that this is like having a conversation in your office yeah. and start off conversations with That's right. things like the weather and what's new. Yes. And <clears throat> Kathy, would you mind passing the sugar? I need some for my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you sugar know, if we, coffee? if we, Vincent, if you could tell us what order we're in on the final video screen, we could actually pass things from. You, we could do this. We could <laughs> do this. That would be funny. Either this would not be wrong. <laughs> that would be fun. You know, in fact, I introduced you because I'm just going across the Zoom window. <laughs> okay. Right? Which really reminds me of Hollywood Squares, right? A yes. little bit. I was thinking Brady Bunch, but yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I go with Brady Bunch. I, did, I don't know what Brady Bunch is. So I, oh, that was fun. It was I know fun. Hollywood Squares where they had, oh, it was like yeah. three, six, nine, right? Generational Something thing, like Brianne. We're, we're I Brady guess. Bunch generation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because 
Brady Bunch is after my <laughs> time. Okay. I was just on a, um, a Zoom with a high school in Tennessee, Governor's High School. They're graduating, and they asked me, so they had watched my course videos this semester. So the teacher asked me to come on, and uh, they were all in rows. It was great to see everybody. <laughs> they're all, and here's the thing. He didn't tell them I was coming on, and so oh, then, nice. then I go on the Zoom, and they're like, <laughs> and then they're smiling. Dr. I go, Vincent Reckon Yellow. And they said, I said, why are you smiling? Nobody ever smiles when they see me. <laughs> and so by the way, fun. kids, he's known as Grumpy. So seeing him smile is unusual. So that was fun. And a shout out to them. And maybe some of them will end up at one of our schools. So uh, congratulations to all the graduates. And congrats. Yeah. Good stuff. So, and they asked me questions for a while. And that was a lot of fun. And one of, one of them asked me, uh, why politics was interfering with uh, control of the outbreak. And that's another thing. I get emails all the time, people saying, keep politics uh, out of science. Yeah, you've got a few in this hey, show. If yeah. the politicians are willing to keep the politics right. out of science, we certainly will. That's what here, I said. Exactly. We didn't that's, here, here. that's exactly what I said. And I, I now I, I don't care anymore. I ended by saying, don't ever tell me what not to talk about. Okay, <laughs> You can tell me what to talk about. I have no problem with that. The only people who can tell me what not to talk about are the ones on the show with me, okay? Because I'm 67. I've been in virology for 40 years. Don't tell me what to talk about. I can do whatever I want, okay? <laughs> That's it. I've, I've given up being nice guy. Really? <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> when did he start? That's what it, no, you see, a former graduate student's allowed to say that, but I, I couldn't possibly go there. I have to go back to work someday. <laughs> so I wanted to... Uh, thank you for putting this link in. I had forgotten all about it. I had put a link on our Slack channel uh, earlier in the week to this amazing visualization on uh, uh, global causes of death to various causes. And it's animated because it starts at the beginning of 2020 and comes to the present. You know, at the very beginning, the, the leading cause of death, sadly, is suicide. Right. Um, and then malaria, number two, malnutrition, homicide, all the way down. And that's an it's an animation which goes through the months and COVID is all the way at the bottom and then ends up number one position. It as you watch it, it's very eerie. I think yes. Mm -hmm. So it I is. think it's tremendous for that reason. Yeah, it's by Flourish and by Tony Nikonchuk. Really, really good. And evidently, can uh, cancer's not on here because it doesn't account for seven percent of global deaths annually. Well, no. So I think that what they did is they took things that were sort of in the ballpark of COVID because my reading of it was that these are 7% of global deaths. So 93% of deaths are not depicted here. Mm. Oh, right? I, I, okay. Yeah. I think that suicide is at on top because it's the one that's sort of in the right ballpark. Right. Uh, but there are a bunch more that would be much higher than this. I mean, tuberculosis wasn't even mentioned, but that's. Okay. Yeah. That's so that's why, that's why heart disease is not on here. Right. HIV isn't on there either, but right. it should right. be there too. Right. Okay. All right. So according to WHO, the top 10 causes of global death, this is 2016, heart disease, stroke, right. pulmonary disease, lower respiratory infections, Alzheimer's, uh, cancers, Diabetes, road injury, diarrhea, and tuberculosis. Right. Alzheimer's. Okay. Yeah. That's an mm -hmm. old people disease usually. I mean, that tells, that tells you something about it, the aging earth population of people, doesn't it? You know, That's it's remarkable. they also stratify it by income in <laughs> countries, and there's no Alzheimer's in low-income countries. I guess you never get old enough. Because they die earlier. You, you, yeah. never, you never live long enough to get diagnosed. That's it. That's yeah. it. The That's leading it. cause of death in low-income countries was lower respiratory infections, diarrhea, heart disease, and then HIV AIDS, right. which wasn't on the other one. Yeah. And then malaria shows up about uh, midway there. Right. And so, malaria right, so the shows up on your uh, graphic here, and watching sort of COVID overtake malaria is very disturbing. Yes. So I guess we should say the data are manipulated in a way to. Well, the data, it's a selective, it's a subset of causes yeah. of death. Mm -hmm. right. But the point it's making is um, COVID-19 is has now killed more people than all of these causes yeah. of death. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can grab the triangle on the timeline at the bottom and move it along at your own uh, speed if yeah. you want. That's right. Nice. 
Anyway, and there are some things on this list that you know people are scared of. Yes, um, a lot of things so, on the list, right? Um, Terrorist that, attack, fire, yeah, yeah. Showing that COVID is killing more people than these other things people are really scared of is important too. And there, and there are things on the list that we spend we spend a lot of money to prevent, mm. and it's worth putting in perspective. So. Um, you you all most likely saw the vaccine Im- uh, graphic that I posted this week of uh, yes very good just, graphic well it's not mine it's from the Milken Institute no but, but it's good uh, it's a good graphic um, I think it got more eyeballs after I posted it than the Milken Institute got anyway it's a it's in the form of a syringe with all the uh, yeah. there's a line for each uh, kind of vaccine and then phase one two three or four um, but someone wrote to me this is upsetting because it reminds me of the World Trade Center. Uh, hmm. And I said, well, you know what? COVID-19 is causing a World Trade Center's worth of death every month in the U.S. Does that upset you? Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, put it all in perspective. A World tra- Trade Center's worth of death every month. That's incredible. So I understand if you don't test for it, those deaths go away. Is that right, Dixon? That's what you said? Yes. Right. Nobody yes, dies we have if it. you don't test, as we've learned. The fewer the tests, the fewer the right. uh, number of infections. But we could we could take care of this whole uh, this whole pandemic. We just stop right. testing. It'll That's just fade right. away. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. So it's like that old adage, what you don't know won't hurt you, right? Right. Oh, in this so case, folks, we're joking. Know, will hurt you. <laughs> if you yeah. think we're being yeah. political, no, I'm sorry, it's... because this was politicized. And, yes, you know, people have said have in this country that we shouldn't test, so it will go away. Which, for scientists, you can imagine is the most abhorrent thing you can say. Right? Well, and the claim being made, including in in a press conference today, um, was uh, was that the the skyrocketing cases that we're seeing now that states are reopening, uh, that's now that's there are attempts to blame that on increased testing. Oh, the rates aren't really going up; we're just <laughs> testing more. <laughs> yeah, that's which right. Which is absolutely not the case, and you can look at the data and see that's that right. is absolutely right. not. That's yes, right. we're that's testing right. more, but testing is going up a little bit, and cases are going up a whole mm-hmm. lot. Yeah. And um, it's, yeah, this is a yeah, virus. Including right. in which is the loved Texas cases are yes. skyrocketing. So you see that mm-hmm. New York, New Jersey, you can, New York, you can New Jersey also, and Connecticut yeah. have closed their borders to people coming from those states. And and you can see that in states that are well run, the cases are in fact going down, even That's though right. testing is going up. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. and so oh, wait a minute, all, Alan. I think you're onto something here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so t- tests, the, the, the testing is not driving the disease. You mean um, the more the, the more than the more you know, the better off you are. Is that right, what you're saying? Right. So Connecticut, Connecticut, uh, what is it? Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York, and New York. have banded together to. That's correct. Um, that is that's remarkable, um, isn't it? Stipulate that anybody coming from one of the high incidence states, which is a growing list now. How can they tell um, them? How can they? Oh, how can they tell if you came from one of those? States? You just drive from because well, you have a Texas no, right. license plate, right? So, so the deal is that they're putting this rule in place that if you come from one of these states that has uh, cases above a certain percentage of the population of the state, and that's Texas and Florida and Arizona and California and several other, um, uh, if you come from one of those, you are required to to self isolate for two <laughs> weeks on right. arrival in the in. Connecticut That'll or New work. Jersey or New York. Yeah, work. If you don't, and if you get caught not self-isolating after coming from another state, yeah, then you get fined a uh-huh. um, couple thousand dollars, I think. So it's a, yeah, I mean, how are they going to enforce that? They're not going to set up checkpoints at the border, no. at every road. Um, but if something comes up, if somebody is clearly violating this, they'll be able to bust them. And so it's it's a law that exists that's going to be very hard to enforce. Sure. But, they're sure. trying to make a point. Uh, uh, they're trying to make a point. That's the best way to put that, I think. Yeah. Dixon, you had mentioned a few weeks ago you went to a CVS and got a saliva test. Not a CVS. The city of Fort Lee oh, the held city. a free testing for the entire city. Oh, okay. And were you positive for saliva? I was. <laughs> okay, good, good. And that was a one-time thing. I, that's Dixon, because right? my heritage goes back and I'm Flemish. That was a one-time thing, right, Dixon? <laughs> one-time thing. It was a... Um, PCR test. You got the results back in two days. Both my wife and I were negative. Did they? But they also took blood. They took blood, yeah. and they were going to tell us whether we've ever had that before, and we never heard from them again. Mm-hmm. Not a single peep. I uh, think because the antibody test sucks. You know, Dixon, it's a good idea, but unless you do it regularly, it 
place like Fort Lee where people are coming and going from all oh, parts of the tri-state area is not going to. Vincent, the first case in New Jersey for that was here in Fort Lee. Yeah. You from Korea. Anyway, folks, our advice is to stay home if you can. If you Play by the rules. Face masks, physical distancing. Play by the rules. And um, get wash tested. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah. I wish we and, could get tested. Limit, limit the amount of time that you're spending with any given individual because that's probably another factor is that's if right. you're passing somebody, <laughs> then your exposure is short. And if you're just standing there talking with somebody, your exposure is going to be longer. Um, and that's probably yeah. going to make it. And this you will have to do until next summer, in my opinion. I agree. Until I agree until we have a working vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Marlene and I went shopping in Costco today and we speed shopped. We wear we, face we masks? We were in there at 845 and we were out at 910. Did you wear face masks? Of course. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to. You can't go in there without one. Yeah, good. In fact, you can wear gloves as well. Did you get me some food? You didn't ask. <laughs> I wanted to. Um, was okay. that too quick for you, Brian? <laughs> no, it was good. I could have sent you my Costco list. <laughs> you don't get it if you don't ask. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, for the animal lovers are out there, uh, ProMed Mail recently published a list of all the non human SARS CoV 2 infections from the very beginning, starting with the dogs in Hong Kong, which was back in March. There were like three. Hey. In dogs, and then Belgium in March, a cat, yeah. uh, the tiger in New York City, remember the Bronx Zoo in April, and a dog in uh, New York City in April, and then two cats in the U.S. in, in April, uh, two mink farms in the Netherlands right. uh, in April, then two cats in France, cats in Spain in May and June, a cat in Germany in May, a cat in Russia. I wonder if it speaks Russian in May. <laughs> And now a mink farm in Denmark uh, early in, in June, another mink farm. So I would say this is pretty rare, right, compared to the millions of human infections. And uh, I don't know why it's rare, whether it's a matter of contact or that the animals are less susceptible. Uh, is, I, I don't intend this entirely sarcastically, but maybe it's the testing. Yeah, um, how, how many, many animals how many are being tested? Are, yeah, how many animals are being tested? No, I think that's a great right. point. Yes, it's because fine. in the case, what's interesting in the case of the mink farms, at least I, I didn't um, know about the one in Denmark, but the Netherlands, where we talked about those cases, um, it seemed like humans introduced. Well, it was the case that humans introduced the virus. Um, it spread to the mink, and it looked like quite a large proportion of the mink population actually caught the virus. Um, so the animals mm. were susceptible and I, the data from cats at least seems to imply that they don't have too much trouble catching it from their owners. Um, it's probably testing then. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if maybe there's a lot more of this going on than we're seeing. And just from my own experience of having had to take a cat to a vet recently, um, that is not a trivial process these days. There's a whole, you know, you've got to hand them the case and step back and, yeah. and all this. Um, so it may, it may be more common than we realize. Yeah, you're right. Good point. I think it could be a, a transmission point and we probably should know more about what fraction sure. of animals, pets especially, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if they're not symptomatic. Right. Uh, we may miss some of this. But as far as we can tell, um, it's the animals getting it from the humans. We don't have really much evidence of it going back the other way mm -hmm. to humans who wouldn't otherwise have been exposed. I mean, if you think about a domestic cat, if one person in the household brings home SARS-CoV-2 and manages to give it to the cat, they've probably already given it to everybody else in the house anyway. So it's not like your cat is any new risk. Uh, while I was on ProMed Mail, another uh, outbreak caught my eye. Horses. Uh, vesicular stomatitis in horses. And this I picked because VSV is one of the vectors uh, we've discussed <laughs> right. a lot. And, of course, I really picked it for Kathy because she used to work on VSV. And now she will say, mm -hmm. not for that long, but... Uh, it's true. It's not a, for that long. <laughs> but a, it, You did, and, right? And I actually <laughs> always thought of it as being primarily in cattle, but... Reading up on it from this, it's evidently more prevalent in horses or 
yeah. Anyway, these ca- these cases were in horses in Kansas and Arizona. Yeah. Kathy, are these life threatening infections? Uh, in humans, they cause flu like illness. In uh, horses and cattle, they cause sores on their lips. I I, I don't think they're life threatening though. Do they or, then not be able to eat properly because they've got these sores and can ingest properly and maybe malnutrition I, is a sequelae? You're asking too many questions. I see. <laughs> they can't. I can tell you more about the molecular virology. Okay. Of okay. The okay. Okay. Listen, the, uh, Kathy, this is what they did to me uh, Wednesday about immunology. Right. <laughs> Dixon, the, the horses have trouble speaking with the lesions on their lips. Well, <laughs> yes. And they do speak, <laughs> right, Mr. Ed, and all that? Right. right. Of course. So these are on farms <laughs> in, uh, in the two states. Uh, so it affects horses and cattle, sheep, goats, swine, llamas, and alpacas. And as Kathy says, lesions on the muzzle, lips, ears, coronary bands, or ventral abdomen. Wow. That sounds pretty painful for the animal. And they get, Indeed. They can get lesions elsewhere. Uh, they may refuse to eat and drink, which can lead to weight loss. Well, that's what I was asking. It can be painful for the animals and costly to the owners. Humans can also be infected when handling affected animals. And as Kathy said, they get flu-like symptoms. So how is this transmitted? Biting insects, black flies, sand flies, ah, and ah. midges. Horse flies. <laughs> Owners should institute aggressive measures to reduce flies on a farm. Right. Good luck. Luck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's also spread by nose-to-nose contact between. Horses do that a lot. So that's yeah. not something you should do in the COVID era. No nose to nose contact. No, but mirrors. The, but yeah, it's the hard to tell. Camel owners that. kiss their camels. Right. So, you know. Premises with animals diagnosed are quarantined for at least fourteen days after the last animal is diagnosed. There are no vaccines. Seems like masks would help that nose to nose contact yes, just exactly. as much as other things. <laughs> take a horse. With, well, I guess a horse couldn't take it off. Well, it would probably rub it off, right? Yeah, you could you could try to separate them if you had enough space on yeah. your farm. But mm-hmm. horses are social animals, so that's Truly. not going to go terribly well. So now this way. reminds me that in Sweden, you you have to have two horses on a farm. You can't just right. have one because right. they're they get depressed. Yep, <laughs> I, I just never forget driving last summer past <laughs> a horse, and uh, Erling Norby said, "Yeah, there must be another one around because you can't just have one." The things you learn, isn't it great? I just mm-hmm. love it. it is. Mm-hmm. So that that explains the origin of that joke that the horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, "Why the long face?" And the horse should respond by saying, "I lost my partner," <laughs> <laughs> or "I have VSV," right? Or "I have VSV," or both. Anyway, vesicular well, stomach had VSV. It wouldn't be able to say that. I, yes, that's I right. Think this talk. joke has not been improved by the virology. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the uh, v- VSV, vesicular stomatitis. Virus is used as a vector. Uh, Irvibo, the Ebola virus vaccine, is in a VSV vector. There are a number of uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines being developed uh, with a VSV vector. So uh, there it is. It's, uh, the vector is attenuated, so it doesn't actually elicit. So you put when you replace this the glycoprotein with a heterologous one, it attenuates right. uh, the pathogenicity of the virus. Yes. Anyway, so I thought that was cool. We we're going to be slipping more and more non. SARS-CoV-2 stuff in here. And, you know, I have to say, I got to complain for just once in, in the whole years of TWIV. That was a joke, by the way. Yes, yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm really listening to this complaint now. I'm not, I was speechless. <laughs> um, this week, I, I every time I post a non-SARS-CoV-2 TWIV, the numbers go way down. I'm so disappointed that people don't want to listen to other stuff in virology, which is very interesting. So this week I posted my conversation with the head of the Environmental Health Agency in Singapore. She talked all about mosquito control with Wolbachia, which is so cool. They're doing it there. That's right. They are doing That's it. That's awesome. Right? And it was really interesting, and people don't want to listen to that. It's It makes well, me realize that we're never going to learn from this outbreak. We're going to go back yeah. to the way it was. Yeah. Exactly. We already have. People, people are interested in the current pandemic. But when the next pandemic comes along and it involves a vector-borne disease, you know, gee, it would have been nice to hear about that mosquito experiment. I'm just sad. I'm not angry. I'm just sad about it. I think it's too bad that, uh, and I know everyone will say, well, I don't have time. I don't buy the time stuff, okay? 
it's not about time ever. It's about your desire to do something. Because I know I use the time excuse myself, and I'm lying. If I say I don't have time, because oh, you can so always make. Remember, yeah. remember the newsman's favorite saying, and is that it, it's not news when a dog bites a man, but it's news when a man bites a dog. That's what news is, right? It's something new. That's what news is. Mm-hmm. Yes. So oh, anyway. Uh, okay. So others have put some cool links in here, Kathy. Yeah. So so when I put in is something I've seen twice now that uh, Donald G. McNeil Jr. of the New York Times has written about the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist from NYU, Paul Romer, has called for daily rapid tests for the coronavirus for every worker who's in contact with others. Mm. That would be 20 to 30 million tests a day. And he estimates that at $10 a test, that would cost about $1.5 billion a week. And even though that sounds really expensive, he argues that that's not going to be as expensive as keeping the country locked down, which is where we may be headed again very soon. Except that testing doesn't prevent the virus from spreading. Oh, but then you can so isolate the, people. Right, right. right. So mm-hmm. the, the figure given here, the $1.5 billion a week, is just for the testing. Right. 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 That's the cheap part of the process. The <laughs> yes. expensive part of what you need is the tracing and isolation so that when somebody does test positive, you know, you reopen the whole economy and now a whole bunch of people are going to be spreading the virus and a bunch of them test positive. You now need to find everybody they contacted and isolate them and have some kind of enforcement mechanism. And that's going to run into a lot of expense or you're going to have to close everything down again. Well, the people well, who are out of work could do that, right? And, yeah. and I would argue that at least if the people themselves become aware of being infected and that they should have a duty to self-isolate, Period. that that would yes. reduce spread. It, that would certainly would. help. Um, I, I there's no additional cost as, to that. So Yeah, I don't, I don't quite get this as an argument for we could open the whole economy if we only did this. I mean, oh, I don't, I don't think that's the argument he was okay. making. Okay. Now, Kathy, the, is, the number yeah. of 20 to 30 million, is this in the whole U.S. or just in New York area? Or um, I'd That's have to look at the Atlantic. My impression was that it was in the whole U.S. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's got to be in the U.S. 20 to 30 million tests a day um, if you're testing workers daily. Hmm. I think this is a bit much. I think everyone should be tested once a week. And that way you can, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of tests, but it's still weekly, which is enough, I think, to pick up uh, a new infection before it spreads too far. And then you, you isolate those. So I don't know where it gets every day, but um, I mean, well, maybe, it anyway, has, maybe, I it has, uh, maybe it has sense that you don't need to test everyone, especially if people are staying home. So well, yeah. that's what he says. You're testing people who are in contact yeah. with We're others. in contact with others. So you're testing your grocery clerks and your cops and firefighters and, um, yeah. and paramedics and, and um, healthcare meat workers. And, uh, yeah, your yeah. meatpackers. Um, you just have to make sure that those people can then stay home if they yes. uh, test positive. That's the other problem. That is the other problem. I guess you would not be tested in this, uh, Dixon, right? Nope, wouldn't. Nor would I. I'm not in contact with Nor anyone. Would I. I did see another person today, but I still don't think I'd be tested. <laughs> you saw another person. But I still want to know if I'm infected. That's for sure. That's so I, I actually went to an eye appointment this week, um, which was scheduled a year ago, and it was it was done very safely. I walked into the building, and they did a temperature check, and made me wash my hands and of course everyone has to wear a face mask and then in the office they have they space you apart there weren't many people in the office and many chairs were xed you couldn't sit on them right but there was no one sitting the and then of course it's just one or two other people the the one thing is when you put your chin on that machine and you're like yes. 12 inches from the, the yeah, person so my she's like sitting across and I'm wondering well she's got a face mask and I do mm-hmm. um <laughs> I, by the way, I picked my eye doctor because she graduated from Barnard. Oh, nice. And uh, that's, of course, many of my students are from Barnard. And so we chat about Barnard all the time. I coached their debate team for a while. You did? Yeah. Wow. Uh, anything else uh, we should talk about before we hit the email? Well, maybe I will bring this other thing up. So Jane Brody in the Science Times on Tuesday had an article about yeah. vaccines and 
she stated this, and of course, her article isn't referenced, and I've never seen this, so maybe our listeners have a source for this information. What she says seems logical and reasonable, but I've never heard it said by an authoritative source. The first doses of an approved COVID vaccine will go to healthcare workers and residents and employees of long-term care facilities. Then essential public servants like police officers, firefighters, and transit workers, as well as workers in food processing plants. Mm -hmm. Not until there are hundreds of millions of doses available sometime in 2021, if all goes well, will the vaccine be offered to the general public. So it seems like a reasonable order, a uh, mm-hmm. priority, yeah. but I, she was stating it as if it's fact. And I just am Backward. curious. Do, wouldn't that vary depending yeah. on who's making the vaccine also? It would be really nice to see the, the, this would have to be legally mandated and it would be nice for a reporter to reference like according to such and such legislation or according to this executive order or according to, um, cause mm-hmm. yeah, this makes sense, but, um, that's going to have to have some kind of, you know, enforcement, enforcement mechanism. I mean, the one, the one figure I saw that was really astounding was how much even the vials to contain the vaccine sure. costs. Yeah. And we don't have those vials yet. So it's kind of a moot point until we oh, actually do You know, most thing. of these vaccines are injected. So we need yeah. 7 billion syringes. Right. I don't even know. I, I uh, looked at an article yesterday on microneedle patch vaccines, and one is being developed for SARS-CoV-2. That would be cool. They could mail it to everyone. Exactly. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. That'd be great. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It absolutely would be. I must say this, uh, Kathy, um, uh, this resource, uh, Jane Brody for the New York Science Times, once wrote an article about how to control pinworm in your children. And the first thing she said was, take off the sheets and shake them out real good. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm not kidding. And mm-hmm. of course, that distributes the eggs everywhere and allows everybody to be exposed. And of course, the kids would catch it again. So the, the way to really do that is to gently roll up the sheets and take them to the washing machine. Don't make any waves, basically. And she actually published a retraction. Mm, good. So she mm. kind of made that up to begin with, I thought. Mm. And that was kind of or, Yeah, she does cite a couple of other sources in other parts of the article, like Paul Offit. Um, but when she gets to this point, I, I don't what know. If, what if you're a vaccine maker and you have enough for virtually everyone? Um, so you made it all in the same instant? <laughs> Or out of two or three <laughs> batches worth, yeah, you did. Oh, no, that's too many. Those are big batches. Those are big. Those are huge batches. You don't make wow. a billion do- You don't make a billion doses per batch. No, no, they they roll out of the factory over time. Dixon, let's get uh, Hotez on, and we he he should know this stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll get Hotez on. He knows Jane Brody too, by the way. <laughs> well, it does that doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, let's do some email. Visto writes, hello, Twivers. All right, so we have a few emails based on previous episodes. One has to do with slaughterhouses. Another has to do with bike riding and some others. Are slaughterhouses a special zone of coronavirus spread? Perhaps you can answer that once I describe the slaughterhouse environment. Uh. I've had the misfortune of working in both cattle and poultry facilities. Cattle processing, the intake of live animals has dung and water hosed everywhere, very humid at the input end. Once the animals are killed and bled, they move to a refrigerated butchering area. The air here is less than 5C and gets quite dry. Good conditions for droplet transmission, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Air is recirculated by the refrigeration equipment as cooling outside air down costs energy. Poultry are first steamed to remove feathers. This area has very high humidity and the worst smelling too. Once gutted, the bird carcasses move to refrigerated areas for cutting and packing. In the boning rooms, workers stand shoulder to shoulder over conveyor tables. Most areas will be hosed down several times a day to wash away blood and guts. So there's water everywhere, some cold, dry air, and everyone is covered in blood. What do you guys think? I think I don't want meat anymore, frankly. (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to work in the one sm- of those. The things. smell from my visits will never leave my memory and no doubt a component in my choice of a vegetarian I'm sure. diet. That does sound like a place for uh, a lot of viral spread. Yes. Yeah, maybe the humidity and the temperature keys there, right? But I think that's, uh, well, we don't know. They, 
there are a lot of factors, I think. The, the close working environment and the, the humidity and, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on there. As someone pointed out last time, there are other environments that have a lot of people indoors, and they don't seem to be as much as this. So maybe the temperature and the humidity have something to do with it. We act, we so we don't know in, until someone does a controlled study, which won't be done, obviously. No. And as someone wrote elsewhere, you know, some things will never test, and we will never know what's going on. That's right. Ah, oh boy, uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Mary writes, dear Twivers. I'm inspired to write by your TWIV 631 responses to the letters asking about the environmental conditions inside a meatpacking plant and inside nursing homes and how these conditions might contribute to disease. You are wondering what all the variables might be that result in illness where many people work together. I have suffered severe illness several times in my life where building environmental conditions led to viral illness and asthma attacks, and I have what I believe is an informed opinion. I'm also a CPA with many years working in the energy industry and some exposure to energy conservation. The conditions mentioned by the letter writers are enclosed spaces that need to be either heated, nursing homes in a cool climate, or chilled, meat packing plants, and temperatures maintained at a significant differential from outside. Heating and cooling are expensive. Many building maintenance operators, in my experience, focus on these costs to the detriment of providing good ventilation or air, air filtering. Over the months I've been listening to your wonderful show, I've heard expert opinion that lack of ventilation in enclosed spaces allows for spread of virus via expired droplets during talking, etc. I suspect that the economics of building maintenance combined with unusual temperature control requirements could be leading to the outbreaks in meat packing, fruit packing, I live in the same state as Yakima, and nursing homes on account of poor ventilation. I think you are on the right track, but if you want to find a common environmental condition that leads to outbreaks, my proposal is look at the need to control temperature. Keep up the good work. Your fan, Mary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah You're wondering where Yakima is. It's in the state of Washington. Yeah. We talked about that in the past. I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is a good idea. The temperature and the recirculation may be. Maybe this yeah. makes a lot of sense. sense mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Wayne writes, hi, Twivers. Japan, here all restaurants and cell phone stores, as well as sporting goods stores, check the temps of incoming customers. Require masks and a hand sanitizer before entry. Restaurants are all set up for serious physical distancing. Mm -hmm. Once at your table, you may remove your mask. Cell phone stores require an appointment and maintain physical distance. When speaking with a representative, Masks remain on, and there is a clear barrier of plastic sheeting separating the customer and rep. Hand sanitizing is mandatory everywhere. People employed in the adult entertainment industry are checked at least three times a week. The adult entertainment industry is legal here. Masks are worn by everyone all the time, and folks line up patiently and physically distance while doing so. Thus, we have a low infection rate. Taiwan and South Korea have the same requirements as Japan. Japan is not a huggy culture. Japan is respectful and considerate, but physical distance is a cultural trait. I am a TWIV addict and pass on to folks here what I learn from your great podcast. Arigato gozaimasu. Okay, I was like, I know the beginning's arigato. But <laughs> <laughs> arigato gozaimasu. Uh, from Wayne. That's cool. Yeah, I think... Uh, some cultures can be doing all these things. Clearly, we cannot, right? Yes. Apparently. All of these things would certainly yeah, help a lot. That's great. That's great. Very I true. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, Dixon. Greg writes, Hi, Twivers. I was struck by the letter that compared Vincent to Alan Alda. The real dead ringer is Mark Marone. Attached is a brief skit. Now, I didn't. I confess I did not watch that skit. Uh, I have followed virology since doing pandemic training at a multi-country health center in response to the avian flu scare. Greg in Wyoming, where physical distancing is an art form. <laughs> so I looked at the video. It's a, a trailer for a Netflix special by Mark Maron. Is he saying uh, it looks like me? Not so much that he looks like you, but... He sounds combining like his looks and his mannerisms, really, and so forth. Then 
I think, hmm. I think so. yeah, I, I can see why he would say that. <laughs> he doesn't look like me at all, for sure. He's just a beard. Well, he has glasses. It. He has glasses. Uh, uh, but uh, okay. yeah, people can watch it and decide for themselves. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, Alan, you're next. Okay. Uh, Richie writes, two, si two styles of arse mask are generally available, <laughs> boxer and brief. The brief is preferred as it tends to offer a closer fit and is therefore most effective. As with face masks, their efficacy is dependent on proper use. However, there are some who habitually flout proper procedure. <laughs> Builders and plumbers are two <laughs> noticeable groups. <laughs> Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. <laughs> oh, I forgot this part. This this was based on the four-year-old's question last time. Do do farts spread COVID-2? Ah. Yes, and I pointed out that there were some uh, coverings, some cloth coverings. I love that it. Might protect us. Isn't that great? <laughs> Art <laughs> Oh, uh, this is just great. What show gets this kind of feedback that is just so <laughs> responsive, right? But they're a bioindicator. If you can't smell the fart, that means right. you might have COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Asia writes for the four year old, uh, she, she provides a, uh, another YouTube video. And on the topic of risk infographics, um, a, um, an interesting graphic from Georgia Tech. Uh, event risk assessment planning tool. Right. So, you, so know, you can put in your location and, yeah. and find out what your risk is if you go to a wedding or a larger gathering or a dinner party or things like that. So you can put in the number of people. Right. Mm. I just put in one and they said, it's no good. You can't put in one. <laughs> it should be a low risk. <laughs> That's and pretty the, cool. Uh, I the, like that. Yeah, the video before that, if you start at 5.14, it's uh, um, uh, Stephen Colbert, I believe. And uh, huh. it, it he quotes an Australian podcaster who directly uh, uh, addresses the uh, flatulence issue. So it's good. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for all the work you do in the team. Do Asia like the Steely Dan album? Great album. Mm -hmm. Love it. Wonderful album. Kathy. Bartek writes, Dear Twiv, I love your show probably because I'm as nerdy as you are when it comes to virology and immunology. I'm the head of R&D at a Swedish company called Mabtech. We are a bunch of nerdy immunologists who have been working with optimization of high throughput T and B cell assays for over 30 years. We've been working hard since February and have now launched SARS-CoV-2 specific T and B cell assays both for memory cells and antibody secreting cells, as well as bridging ELISA in the regular ELISA format, which can be used by any lab. And he gives a link. T cell assays are not that hard. You draw eight mils of blood in a CPT tube, centrifuge 20 minutes, and then you have your PBMCs, which you put together with peptide pool into an ELI spot or fluorospot plate, incubate overnight, and develop. From the same tube, you get plasma for your ELISA. Cells can also be frozen and analyzed at a later time point. These assays have been used for 20 years by vaccine companies for high throughput analysis of vaccine-induced T-cell responses. They are also used in cancer research, autoimmunity, transplantation, and study of natural immune responses to various pathogens. Keep up the great work with the show. If you want, I would be happy to be a guest on the show. All the best. Oh, Bartek. Okay. I'm sorry, we don't pay our guests. That's right. <laughs> <Do not. laughs> I suspect Bartek would come on just to talk. Yeah. So, Brianne, this is pretty cool. We were complaining last time that there are any rapid T cell assays, right? Right, we were. Um, you know, I think that this assay still does have that overnight incubation. Yeah. So, it's not going to be um, as rapid as some of the rapid antibody tests. Um, but this could be a really uh, cool way to look at um, the uh, immune responses. Yeah, we were saying um, that we need to have more T cell analysis. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's not a very labor intensive. No, hands on no. time is pretty short. It's not. You might need an Ellie Spot machine, um, which may not be available in all of your clinical labs. Do you have one, uh, Brianne? I do not have an Ellie Spot machine here. So, I like one. <laughs> I I would take. We had one in graduate school, and I know how to use it very well. <laughs> the um, we did a paper on Wednesday where some individuals who had recovered had no antibodies, but had. T cells, virus specific right. T cells. Mm -hmm. So it was a small group. So we want to know is it more broadly? How common and, is this? Yeah. It's exactly. very interesting. 
And then we said, we hope the vaccines induce T cells if they're important, right? Yes, right. exactly. No, but I think that if this assay is available, um, trying to look at a larger number of people um, as compared to that paper would be really important yes. so that we can try to understand this. Brianne, how much does an Ellie spot machine cost? I have no idea how much an Ellie spot machine costs. Okay. If it were $10, I'd buy you one. Oh, right. <laughs> if, if it were $10, yes, that would be great. Work out a time payment plan. <laughs> yeah, nothing costs $10 anymore, no. right? Brianne, you're next. All right. Um, a used LE spot reader on eBay costs $2,450. That's not bad. That's a brilliant thing to do, Brianne, because if you go to the companies, they never tell you the price. You, I, you always, I just went to Google, and that's, that's great. where it that's came good. up. Yeah, the, 2000, you know it something. works. The ones on eBay don't work. <laughs> I've bought I stuff on eBay that worked. Scientific equipment. Really? It depends Sometimes. on where it's from. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I, for an Ellie Spot machine, that's a fairly complex device that I'm. you'd have to really trust the seller. Yes. That's true. Yeah. I uh, have a, a nitrogen freezer where the, the top is cracked, and you can't buy it anymore. But I, I found it. On eBay. Ah, great. <laughs> but they sell uh, an iron lung on eBay, too, for 30 grand. Good heavens. Does that include shipping? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> that's pretty heavy. Come and pick it up yourself. <laughs> I could make an offer. You know, sometimes the things have make an offer. Uh, right, I'm, sure, I'm sure your family would be thrilled to have an iron lung dropped off. No, I don't want one, actually. But I they, would just, you know, just love to see them deliver that one by drone. But Daniel was saying that, uh, you know, the positive pressure oxygen delivery is a problem it, that itself causes problems and they're wondering whether negative pressure which is what an iron lung is might be better for ventilating some of the covid-19 patients but there aren't many around right right no. yeah in fact no. one of our listeners asked about that about iron lung while yeah. yeah there there was one in the um there's an outbreak uh it, it, Uh -oh. Brian's gone. She's frozen. First time I've seen Zoom uh -oh. freeze up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I was getting some some Cylon-ing in the in the um yeah. audio and then oh, she's gone. We yeah. lost Brian. So Vincent, do you think in somewhere in Arizona desert there's a, a zillion iron lungs just sitting yeah. there rusting away? Yeah, with the airplanes, yeah. <laughs> with the airplanes. <laughs> Probably not. I don't okay. know where I just went. You went to Iron Lung Land. I guess. That's right. That's right. You inhaled but forgot to exhale. You froze up and then disappeared. Did you feel uh, funny? You I didn't feel into funny. The negative pressure. I uh, guess so. I, oh, I went go. away and then it automatically logged back in. She was oh, nice. Dixon, can yeah. you take uh, the next one? I would be happy to. This was Jim Wright's, correct? Yes. Jim Wright's. Hello, Twivenistas. Greetings from St. Louis, where it is currently 29 C84F and dew point 20 degrees C, relatively dry for this area. Happy birthday to Rich. Ignore the folks that suggest that this podcast might be too toxic or whatever. That is what makes TWIV a rich, enjoyable experience. Regarding your listener mail from TWIV 631, the Scandinavian transplant Pico Corna. Cornovirologist. Cornovirologist. Give, me, give me some time here. Pycornovirologist said that the Fahrenheit scale is nonlinear. Incorrect. It's just as linear as Celsius. And as a person who started out in chemical engineering but decided on straight chemistry because chemical engineering was too mired in English units, <laughs> I still wrestle with Celsius. All the other uh, SI units I understand and can internalize, but Celsius makes no real sense for practical purposes. Scientific purposes, yes. How warm is it outside? No. Here is an excellent ex explanation for the recently deceased Byron or Bryon Toss, master shiprigger and great practical DIR. Do it yourself. Or. The Fahrenheit scale makes much more sense for how we experience the world. So for our environment, it's quite practical. For doing calorimetry, uh, calorimetry in the lab, Celsius is fine. Thank you for all you're doing. It's so nice to have a voice of scientific reason in this miasma of anti-think. I'm a relatively new listener to TWIV, but have learned much in the last month or two. From a mere chemist who has a newfound fascination with all things virology. Jim. I love the term anti-think. Great. Yeah, exactly. Can exactly. we get that? Yes. In, can we get that in our title? 
We probably can. I just think the way he, he said this, this uh, voice of scientific reason in the miasma of anti-think. It's, it's just great. <laughs> I mean, miasma of anti-think. That's good. Beautiful. I'm, I'm glad to be per- that we are perceived that way. Um, yeah. And uh, I wish more people would, would listen, right? <clears throat> Alan, you're next. Uh, Anon writes, um, that's a lovely name. <laughs> uh, dear Team Twiv, I'm a PhD in theoretical physics, and when, I, and when that career went nowhere, I switched to IT. I'm also an avid <laughs> cyclist, so allow me to comment on two questions and answers from Twiv 631. Reverse engineering is indeed taking a program and from that generating source code that would, when compiled, produce the original program. But it goes further than that. It also includes trying to understand from the generated code what the purpose of the program is and what it uses. To take the unavoidable example of a computer virus, you want to try and find out whether it would destroy your hard drive, encrypt your data, send out spam emails, or let your computer be part of a botnet involved in its distributed denial of service attack on some government agency, just to name a few nasty possibilities. You also want to know how the virus would gain access to your computer and how it would be able to grab hold of the computer resources to do its nefarious work. So John's question would be, Could you, from the genome of SARS-CoV-2, tell how it would infect a cell, how it would replicate, and what the effects on the cell uh, and the infected would be? Um, Yeah, that's kind of the ultimate goal of molecular biology, but we're nowhere near there yet. So I Uh, I think this is a good point because we didn't really interpret this reverse engineering. We said, yeah, if you have the sequence, you can get the virus back, but looking at the sequence won't tell you everything about how it replicates. It's just a parts list, right? right? But I mean, you could see, oh, it's got a spike, so. Well, and it's know. just it's just a predicted parts list. It doesn't even yeah. give you all the details of how those parts are, are structured sure. and how they're made. And uh, but there's you a could see that of- you could see that it makes a polyprotein and that it needs a protease. Sure. And that's that's the cover of science this week. So oh, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a lot of useful information you can get from it, but you cannot really reverse engineer it the no, way you you're, could you're right, you're right. Uh, reverse engineer a computer virus, because yeah. of course a computer virus, having been created by humans, is going to follow certain logic that we comprehend, um, whereas a biological virus doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you were going to try to figure out the effects on the cell. Um, you'd need to also know an awful lot about how the cell works that I'm not sure we fully understand. We're we're definitely not up to speed on that yet. Uh, Continuing, as for Dean's question with regard to cycling, group rides are more a social event than a competition and exertion levels tend to be lower than in a race. So the number of droplets ought to be fairly low. When you ride on a bicycle, you create a zone of lower air pressure behind your back. When riding alone, air will be rushing in from all four sides, top, bottom, left, right to level the pressure difference, leading to some turbulence. When riding in a group, the rider behind you will fill that area of low pressure with his body, reducing the amount of air rushing in and reducing turbulence. The rule is the closer, the bigger this reducing effect. A quick search on this yielded a paper studying this effect by means of computational fluid dynamics and verifying the results in a wind tunnel. Gives a citation. So increasing the distance to six feet would actually increase the chance of hitting a droplet rather than reducing it. And if you're concerned about catching too many droplets, you can always don a snooty and pull that over your nose and mouth. Great advice. Okay. Since we're not really cyclists, you know, we don't know this. I am. I I do a fair amount of cycling recreationally, but I don't do any kind of organized group rides. I've never raced. I did some group rides for a while and, and some people in the group are highly competitive. So. Yeah. Always. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. This is a much better answer than my answer at the time of riding behind someone carrying a plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wanted to know, we wanted to do the experiment. So Kathy, we said, uh, put some, some harmless phage in the people's mouth mm. and nose and then ride behind them and catch it on a plate. <laughs> yeah. But I like that experiment. Yeah. I mean, they've done those kinds of, you know, the common one is to put the stuff on your hands and see how washing gets rid of it. And so right. Right. And then there was the one with the phage in the in the uh, on the hands, and then they went to the, do the vacuum air dryer. Remember that one? And they found the phages yeah. were spewed all over the room. Yeah, I stay time. away from those hand blow dryers whenever I can. Me too. Apparently, it was unfaged by that treatment. Unfaged, yeah. Um, Sorry, Alan. Casey writes. I'd like to address cases from Salt Lake City. 
I'd like to address the question on TWIV631 about group cycling. This has actually been looked at a few months ago in a Belgian-Dutch study, for, and there's a link there. It has some great visualization, seems to be pretty well done. It's a bummer for Dean, who asked the question, and I, that group cycling rides or hockey with my buds may be off the table for quite a while. That's what I think. Uh, just stay home. <laughs> just listen to TWIV. You could listen all day, actually. I wonder how many you, days you it would need take. Some, you need some kind of exercise. I don't get right, any wait, exercise. I don't do anything. I'm just about to ask a very important question. What? How long would it take, starting with TWIV 1, to listen to all of them consecutively? It's a good, I'd have to, to do the math. and that's To just, binge on TWIV. I mean, it's finite, obviously. Well, yeah. It's going to be in the ballpark of 1,000 hours, I think. At least. Two hours yeah. per episode. Because yeah. per even time. though we're at 632, there are a lot of unnumbered episodes. Mm, yes. There are some that are going to be less than that are, you know, an hour yes. long, but still yeah. over well over 1,000. Yeah, unfortunately, you'd have to go through and add them up hand by hand, right? Maybe some listener wants to do that. Just going uh, through and adding up the time. Some, some listener who's in IT could probably scrape your website and add, add up the times. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's very simple. Okay, continuing. I became a professional armchair virologist on March 16th with no previous experience. The gym I was working at closed that day, which was spent for me driving home uh, from the Costco, from Low Carb Denver 2020. The Costco and Eagle st still had some toilet paper. The room full of extremely smart doctors, nurses, and fellow nutrition coaches were all nerding out on the most the most over a study, mouse study, to be fair, that compared mice infected with influenza and how diets would affect their outcomes. They showed that mice fed a ketogenic diet and infected with influenza virus had a higher survival rate than mice on a high-carb normal diet. Specifically, the researchers found that the ketogenic diet triggered the release of gamma-delta T cells, immune cells that produce mucus and cell linings of the lungs, while the high-carb diet did not. Anecdotally, most people in the room noted that since eating a low-carb or ketogenic diet, they rarely get sick anymore. That's also consistent with myself and the people I work with. But when we look at who COVID-19 is impacting the most and seeing that nearly every comorbidity for a negative outcome is metabolic in nature and, in my humble opinion, avoidable and reversible, why are we not looking at this more closely? We know that only 12% of the people in this country are considered metabolically healthy. This seems like high time for us to address this. I'm curious to know if you're thinking about which lifestyle factors can help the general populations the most. Youth. It's youth. <laughs> yes. What things do you recommend? Youth. Hey, youth. youth. What well, thoughts youth. would be that proper nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, and sunlight would be pretty high up, but I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right. So most 80% of infections are mild, and most of those are under 65 of age. All right? Correct. So age is a problem. So whatever happens during aging is the, is the risk factor which includes, you know, deterioration of immune responses, uh, met metabolic Long bone and content, <laughs> empty bones, <laughs> sedentary lifestyles, you know, uh, loss of muscle uh, strength in the lungs, particularly, so you can't cough as well, etc. Podcasting all day long, and I'm not sure that uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that exercise and good nutrition would overcome that, but I'm sure people would argue that that it would. So it's not my my area. Exercise and good nutrition are good for just about everybody, everything. Yeah, um, except and me, except that's me. why for decades every public health authority of any kind has been browbeating the public to exercise and improve right. their nutrition. Right. And um, so, you know, the, the Casey is raising a, a valid point that these are measures that could people could conceivably take that would. Um, reduce their comorbidities, and and certainly, you know, we know obesity is a major co comorbidity. We know that um, uh, heart disease is a major comorbidity for this that uh, drastically increases diabetes. Uh, so all this stuff, yes, um, these are these are factors that could, in theory, be controlled. But since we've pretty much not managed to accomplish that on any large scale in the past, I don't know, 40, 50 years. Um, I'm not optimistic that all of a sudden people are going to, are going to respond to this message and, and act on it. They may a little bit more now that, um, uh, that folks are unemployed, you know, you've got a little more time to exercise, you've got time to cook your own meals, but not everybody's going to be in a position to do that. Um, 
And I, I, yeah, so this is, this is an interesting theoretical perspective, but I don't think it's going to have much public health impact. And Kathy has something. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so uh, part of the reason why I haven't been here for the last several episodes is uh, because of American Society for Virology events, uh, one of which was going to some of the virtual workshops. And there was a really good talk from someone in Stacey Schultz Cherry's lab about uh ferrets and looking at lean ferrets and obese ferrets. I saw that one too. It was great. And their ability to transmit the virus and uh, to lean or obese uh, recipients and so forth. And uh, one of the take-home messages from that was that the obese ferrets were going to have more tendency to have high virus loads and to transmit the virus. And also that uh, same person, Rebecca, whose last name I can't remember, um, and Stacy wrote uh, uh, Pearl for PLOS Pathogens, which will be out. And they looked at uh, reviewing the literature about malnutrition, which, by the way, includes undernourishment and obesity. So malnutrition just means bad nutrition, either too much or too little. And the factors that are involved in that uh, immune factors population factors, uh, viral genetics, and evolution factors. And so I think there is some evidence that supports the nutritional aspects of susceptibility to infectious sure. disease. I mean, this, yes, this, I, I'm sure there have been epidemiological studies of this, right? Yeah. As well. Yeah, yeah I, would I would agree. That too. And the, um, the exercise physiology is also very much in line with all this, that it, it improves all the good stuff. And um, so these are all, these are all very solid data points arguing that yes, you should eat right and exercise. And, um, and anybody who didn't know that has probably been living in a cave. Exactly. Um, the ketogenic diet paper made sort of a big splash in immunology when it came out. Um, and it did mostly focus on gamma delta T cells. Um, I don't, know much about how gamma delta T cells are acting with uh, this particular virus. Um, and I think that there, it was interesting enough that we, that people should probably look a little bit more into some of these things, but that paper is relatively recent and hasn't been followed up quite yet. Well, you know, if it, it, you're right. You should eat well and exercise, but you can't mandate it. So it's up to people to do it. No, but there are countries where, where they do that whether you've mandated or not, like Iceland, for instance, they had a very low death rate. They had a, an, an average infection rate. But they had a very low death rate because they are on a keto diet. They eat a lot of protein. They eat a lot of fish. There's not a lot of vegetables grown in Iceland because of their six months of winter. So, uh, But they store their fish and they eat it. Uh, it's smoked and it's preserved in so, certain other ways. So they live in a very high protein diet. And I think the same thing is true for uh, New Zealand for not fish, in this case, it's lamb. And uh, mm. they also are on a very, I would say, high keto diet. Uh, whether they had a low death rate from this as well is debatable. But I'm sure, Vincent, you're right. Someone is looking into this very, very closely because it has huge implications for uh, outbreaks of various other kinds of so, diseases. Let's say a study is done, a human clinical study, clear amazing benefits of exercise. <laughs> nutrition. Right. So this is put in all the papers and all the news shows. Do you think everyone would do it? No, of course no. not. Of course because not. we already have studies that show the clear benefits yeah. of exercise and good diet. And that's right. So that's why everybody we're, knows this. That's why we're making vaccines. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, Thanks. can you take the next one? Sure. This is Simon writes. Yes. Dear Twiv, I love the podcast. It's sunny here in Wales, 28C, with a risk of thunderstorms later in the day. With regard to the German meatpacking plant, C19 outbreak, oh, COVID-19 outbreak there, what, there was also a similar case in North Wales. And Simon gives a link. 200 confirmed cases in a chicken factory. It seems very similar to the North Rhine-Westphalia outbreak, which seemed to be linked to overcrowded working and living conditions for the mainly migrant working community. Wales has been very cautious in its devolved healthcare strategy, in essence copying England's policy, but with a three-week delay in implementing compared to England. 
Testing has been low and sporadic with an even lower rate of antibody testing. How will we know when we reach herd immunity? Sorry, what did you say, DDD? <laughs> herd, herd is a little bit misspelled. Huh? Right. Oh, so, and that's your comment, which you put in. in yeah. uh, that's right. Yes. You're supposed to put it in in colored ink, which I'm fixing for I you. I don't now. know how to do that yet. Okay. Kathy, can you pronounce the <laughs> Celtic uh, words there? Um, no, I think it's uh, maybe Kofi and Kinnis, mm. but I'm not sure. I didn't look that one up. <laughs> I did look up the. Uh, Aligato, uh, no, awesome. other one, yeah. But when, how will we know when we reach herd immunity? Well, I hope we're bre- after you we- get the vaccine, <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. if they can develop a decent test, serological yeah. test, yeah. huge. Well, you don't have to do everyone; you do enough so that you get a statistical estimate of yeah. the entire population. So what's the number of events that you have to reach? 70, 70 to eighty percent uh, yeah. for an R naught of two to three, yeah. It's quite yeah. high, yeah. Pretty high. Um, and you have to maintain that. Well, at once you've got there, you will because then... Uh, uh, the virus will vanish. The, the virus will yeah. be lower, but then... <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Trump. <laughs> then you... <laughs> I have to learn when people are joking and not. It's, no, I, I want to know. <laughs> a lot of evidence now suggests that the antibody levels don't remain high for very long after you've been infected. So uh, herd immunity may last... Uh, several months, but it might not last a full year. Well, and we don't know what what type of immunity the herd immunity yeah, will be. Is exactly, it sterilizing, protective. That, that, that too. Yeah. Well, and we don't. We also don't know if the antibodies are the important. That's right. Um, right. Correlate of protection. Maybe when we get together, this um, rapid. T cell test with my eBay Ellie spot reader. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then uh, we'll be, be able, able to. You can see. only hope. All right. <laughs> you want to? You want to call for? A, you should do a Kickstarter, Brianne, to pay for your I should. Ellie spot reader. But then you have to collect serum from people and uh, and do the uh, test, and that's going to require an IRB protocol, and it's very complicated. Messy they don't sell those mm-hmm. on eBay. They no. Do not. All right. No, they uh, don't. <laughs> Brianne is next. Sure. Rob writes. I've been listening since the start of the pandemic and will continue to do so after we come out of the other side of it. I really appreciate your podcast. I'm just a police officer. So a lot of it's over my head, but my knowledge in this field has increased tenfold in the time I've been listening. I heard on episode 631, your wish for a rapid antigen PCR test as paramount and wanted to highlight to you the work of Avacta Group in the UK partnered with Cytiva, formerly GE Healthcare Life Sciences, um, is currently doing in an attempt to bring a rapid saliva test that gives results within 10 minutes to market. Their aim is to be best in class, and so far the results suggest the same. Clearly, if this is achieved, it will be absolutely game-changing. I've copied a link for your interest. Thank you. How rapid is this? 10 minutes. Yeah, he says 10 minutes. And this is like a dipstick type uh, spit. It's saliva. Oh. Yeah. Well, mm. this is good um, as long it's as it's not- sensitive, right? And it, All right, so, so this will rapid, detect rapid test strips to detect SARS CoV 2 spike. That's great. And of course, it, it uh, will tell you if you're currently infected, the antigen exactly. will go away afterwards, but that's fine. Right. And in fact, you can imagine that this with a PCR might be increase the uh, specificity, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So this and this is, might help with the testing we were talking about at the beginning of yeah, you know, twenty to thirty million. To yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sure m- many more of these are coming online. Yes. So absolutely. I mean, I don't know if ever anyone remembers we did a episode some time ago about the use of CRISPR uh, in making diagnostic tests, and they one of them was called Hercules, where it's a single tube. It can be done in the field in a few minutes and detects nucleic acid. It's just remarkable. So I'm, I'm assuming people are doing that and we'll hear about it, but right. that would be really great also. <coughs> Dixon. Yeah. Sure. Rob. Oh, I'm sorry. Randy writes, <clears throat> I am a hospital and school-based speech language pathologist in the suburbs of Salt Lake City, Utah, where it's expected to be a sunny and high 93 degrees Fahrenheit, 33.9 Celsius. I love all the knowledge I get from your podcast, which I started listening to in March. You can skip to the highlighted part. Oh, fine. Uh, I have a 13-year-old. I have 
13-year-old twin boys who are very serious, you might say obsessed, about basketball. My husband coaches them as well. They are diligently working on trying to make the high school team and practice their little hearts out all spring at home when the spring leagues were canceled. Recently, a few leagues have started up again for the kids at the higher competitive level. They are limiting spectators to 10 per team, or none at all based on venue, encouraging masks, spectators at all times, and players before and after games, temperature slash symptom checking, and passing around hand sanitizer. I was very hesitant to participate in this league, but I was outnumbered, and it's happening whether I like it or not. In my mind, there's nothing that can be done about players and refs potentially spreading virus to each other during game. However, I remember a few weeks ago, you had a dental professor discuss using hydrogen peroxide rinse periodically during dental procedures to temporarily reduce viral load in the mouth. Would having players and refs swish H2O2 before games and maybe at halftime be an effective option for reducing spread between players during a game? I would love any research articles available to send to those running the league if you have them. Thanks, Wendy. It's a good suggestion, actually. So uh, last time, Rich found this risk um, chart for common activities. And he actually mm -hmm. looked into it, so it seems like it's uh, based on some information. So playing basketball is 7 out of 10, where 10 is very right. risky. Um, Absolutely. It's up there with public schools and public pools and going to school. So yeah. it's very risky. I don't know. This, this H2O2, uh, you know, the, how often were the dentists doing it? Every 10 minutes or something? Something like, like that. Oh, and it's not basketball players. They're going to object to H2O2. Frankly, I think basketball should be out. I, and then you said it's not going to happen. I understand that. But I think it's highly risky because of the close contact and the heavy breathing and so forth. Yeah. And I doubt yeah, that I hydrogen think, peroxide I, I is going to make I think this ought to be out of bounds. Um, but there are no <laughs> papers. I don't, there are no papers. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is we just, don't have, there, we're, we're, we're off road here in terms of data. Um, nobody's done this before. Um, and, and saying this as a parent of a, of a 14 year old who is actually now participating in a tennis camp, um, this was a discussion that we had in my, now tennis is a very different sport and, True. and we got reassurances and I have, have verified that things are being run in a way that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I drop her off in the morning and immediately the, the head coach walks up with the thermometer and checks her temperature. Um, everybody, they, they sit, um, I think when it rains, they'll probably go inside the building for lunch, but they, they've got uh, lawn chairs. Everybody has to bring their own lawn chair. Um, so their, their breaks and their lunches, their chairs set out apart from each other outdoors. Um, and of course, tennis itself, they're a hundred feet apart, or if they're, if they're doing any, any doubles or that sort of thing, they're 10 feet of 20 feet apart. Um, but even then that we were concerned that, this does add some risk, and I think basketball would multiply that by a lot. No now, Alec, question. Uh, the person who sent in that question about tennis, he wrote in, his email didn't make the cut, but he said he, he has been playing tennis using your recommendations, and one of his partners tested positive, but he's okay. He was tested, and he's negative because he did all Good. the things you said. So he said, thank you very much. Huh. <laughs> yeah, and those were, those were, by the way, credit where it's due. Those are USTA procedures that yeah. um that they've come out with that make a lot of sense um so alan you're next okay uh mark writes dear twiv uh, this is the first mark from 629 not the second or the third <laughs> uh on 629 dixon mentioned two versions of the polio vaccine one you inject versus swallow the injectable vaccine trains your systemic immune memory but despite having trained immunity your gut is still naive so you get infected but not sick? How does that work? I'm having a difficult time reconciling what is meant by this comment. Is the implica <laughs> implication that epithelial cells in the gut have a mechanism of trained immunity independent of systemic immune memory? Any insight would be greatly appreciated. Uh, yes, and you, you got on the right track there. Um, so the injected vaccine, the 
antibodies that we're talking about, uh, and Brianne will correct me if I if I go off track here, but um, you have you have different types of immunoglobulins, different types of antibodies that your body generates in response to a foreign threat. Um, the mucosal immunity uses an immunoglobulin A antibody. Um, the bloodborne immunity uses an immunoglobulin G antibody. And if you get the injected polio vaccine, you will develop a robust IgG response, and that's great. And you're protected from developing the disease, developing the neurological part of the disease because the virus can't circulate in your blood. But your gut has never seen those antigens. And so if you are exposed to the virus um, after that vaccine, the virus can still replicate in your gut. There's no no real protection there. And you can then pass it along and spread it to other people. Um, if you get the oral vaccine, it acts just like the wild virus in terms of the way it goes through the gut. It replicates in the gut. It gets a little bit into the blood. Your gut develops the IgA response. Your blood develops the IgG response. And you have both of those then. And so you won't, not only are you protected, but you will not act as a carrier or you act as a very poor carrier um, if you get infected again. So there's, there's mucosal immunity and there's blood immunity and the two don't necessarily, you know, you, you can have one without the other. Absolutely. Um, and we understand considerably less about mucosal Im immunity and we know that there are some unique features, um, that must be happening, but we don't quite know how they are happening. So, you know, um, if I, go eat a hamburger after this, um, I don't make an immune response to cows. Um, and so there's something different going on in, in my gut um, in terms of Im immunity and immune responses. And how exactly that difference happens is actually not very well understood. Yeah. So you're, you're moo tolerant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and parasites that infect the gut are even more complicated than viruses in some respects because not only do the antibodies count, but also um, a uh, proliferation of uh, goblet cells. The goblet cells produce mucus, and the mucus actually hypersecretes into the um, perimucosal space, the layer between the, out, the lumen of the gut and the cells themselves. And some parasites are actually repelled by that response alone without the use of antibodies at all. They're sort of flushed out by this outpouring of mucus that uh, confounds them as to where they are. And would so Giardia be an example of that? I don't know, but Trichinella would be a good example of that. <laughs> so um, there's a, uh, an immune response called rapid uh, immunity, which occurs on the second infection. The, the parasites don't even get a chance to make contact with the cells. There's an enormous uh, outpouring of mucus and out, out they go. Oh, by the way, they're infectious for another animal in the feces of that one animal that had that response. So it might work in favor of the parasite rather than the host. <laughs> there is a PPS there you might want to read. Ah, uh, yes. Um, there was a postscript and then a, PP, a PPS. There are murmurs of the possibility of antiviral immune memory and fruit flies that are even <laughs> transgenerational. Transgen uh, but this is in its infancy. I'm thinking of results by Carla Saleh's lab. She's great, by the way, where her lab shows that complementary viral DNA is detectable in offspring of parents infected with an RNA virus. I saw her speak about this, and she's following up now. A possible explanation is retrotransposition of virus into the genome, which oh, ends up inherited, but alternately some plasmid-like mechanism in the microbiome or something even weirder could explain it. <laughs> and... Um, gives a link to the article. So yeah, that sounds like a really interesting phenomenon. Fascinating. Carla has Heritable been on Twiv. Viral immunity. Carla's been on Twiv. Okay. Yes. You should look back in the back catalog. You know, just because something is old doesn't mean you can't listen to it. In fact, all the Twivs are pretty much still relevant. And we had Carla on uh, some time ago. So check it out. We've had a lot of people on, actually. We should yeah. get her back yeah. to ask, us, ask her what happened since she was on last. Sure. Un unfortunately, the guest list on TWIV is not up to date on the micro hers, TV. Her name is on it. Yeah, it's not up to date because I'm supposed to take care of it. And <laughs> it's did, just, you, did you have other things that you're doing on that yeah. episode? Is she what? Did she talk about this work on that yeah. episode? Well, okay. the, the idea that it's copied to DNA, I think so, yes. 
I believe okay. she did. Uh, it looks good. like 301. Yeah. Yeah. Googling worked better. 301. Well, and, Which, and at Mark, our current rate was probably about uh, eight months ago. September 2014. <laughs> 2014. Yeah, pre-pandemic. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I had not come across this paper before, and I am looking forward to taking a look at it. Yeah, so and you should listen to her. It. You should listen to her twiv. I encourage people to look back. There's a lot of interesting stuff back there in the back catalog. It's actually a treasure, if I would say. My there are some great myself. episodes. Yes. All right. So we have one from Bob here. And he writes, he starts by saying, I love the car talk of virology. And that's exactly what this is. That's how we started, Vincent. Do you recall? The car talk guys. I didn't imitate anyone, Dixon. We started no, but, a well, unique but we thing. We likened ourselves to that show. Well, you did maybe, because I never heard of it until you mentioned it. Oh, okay. How's, how's your uh, carburetor, Dixon? Um, if I had one, I'd let you know. <laughs> I'm still breathing. How's that? So my question is about fallback strategies of control. I live in North Carolina, a red state with a blue governor. The results have been predictably mixed. I first despaired over testing, then despaired that we would ever catch up with contact tracing. Then my data geek kicked in and I saw that over half of fatalities are in congregant facilities, nursing, retirement homes, etc. Would not a reasonable fallback strategy be to circle the wagons around these facilities with testing, first, le second, and third level tracing of employee contacts, etc. until the vaccines come? Would love to hear your thoughts. And in fact, that's what we mentioned at the top, right? Every few days testing of people in situations just like this. And uh, they would get the vaccine first as well. I think it's a great idea because there you have the high, not only the high risk population, but closed conditions. Uh, and there the issue is people coming in every day to work there, right? They're bringing the virus in or visitors, I suppose. And so they should be extensively tested. Yeah. And we're not doing this because if you don't test, there's no circulation of virus. Right. Exactly. I'm sorry it's so, if you're, it's if so you're tragic offended. that we're talking about this as a fallback strategy when it should have been one of the first things yeah, exactly. implemented. Should have been done because we knew we knew from the data coming out of China in January that this was a virus that was uniquely dangerous to the elderly, and that it, when we found that it was spreading at the community level, it was obvious to everybody that nursing homes were mm -hmm. going to be at immense risk. And there should have been there should have been a focus immediately on those kinds of facilities and this kind of cocooning. And we didn't. And yeah, that'd be a great thing to implement now. Um, <laughs> you remember that the first major outbreak was in Washington state in a nursing home. Yes. So and the point is that nursing homes in general fall under about three different categories, the high end, the middle end, and then the low end. And most of them are in the low end. Most of them depend on federal uh, grants in order to support the running of those facilities, and they pay people the minimum wage. And uh, it's undervalued in terms of the service that they render because they, like in all the people living in there, are eventually going to die in a relatively short period of time. And so that's one of the tragedies of getting old is that uh, you lose your social value as uh, you drop out of the workforce as you stop contributing to society in, in a general way. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in one of these, I wouldn't call them flop houses, but if you were to go into one and say, I wouldn't live in one of these on a bet, uh, you would agree that, that unless you pay top dollar, you're not going to find a similar abode the same as the one you now live in. And that's that's where retirement benefits come in, and people that are that had a good job to begin with can afford to stay in those kinds of facilities. Everybody else takes it's a crapshoot basically as to what you end up in, and it's a it's travesty. It's 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 a it's under the rug kind of stuff that no one wants to talk about. But eventually, we're all going to have to talk about that also. He uh, has a P.S. The recent clinical roundup changed my data models significantly. Besides. The younger demographic currently adding new cases. I think the steroids, proning, and anticoagulants will reduce fatalities during the next wave, or whatever we call it. It will be a wave of illnesses and not deaths. I fear how this will play out in the press. I understand your fear completely. However, um, yes, and as we heard Daniel say earlier, the anticoagulants, the paper just came out about those, can really help. 
Um, the steroids can help as well. The proning helps. However, I fear the number of cases will outstrip the hospital capacity and therefore we won't be able to treat people with these good approaches. So if we have too many cases, that's the problem, right? Sounds sure. like they're getting close to that in some parts of Texas. Yes. And then there's the long-term sequelae would have nothing to do with the virus itself, but all the damage right. it caused. That's right. So sad stuff. Kathy. Jennifer writes, hi, Twiv. Earlier you had a podcast where the Ebola virus was discussed. I had to send you a picture of my treetop looking eerily similar to the iconic slide photo of the virus. Something to lighten up the day. Thanks for your wonderful podcast. It is my go-to source for factual information. And she sends this picture that looks very much like Fred Murphy's is, iconic yes, picture. Does. That is good. Ebola. And this allows me to say that we could use this for today's show image because the WHO has declared that the second worst Ebola outbreak in history is over. This is the one taking place in uh, primarily Eastern Congo after two years and nearly 2,280 deaths. Mm. Uh, they're declaring it over. Wow. I appreciate that Jennifer looked up and just made the connection with Ebola virus. It's mm -hmm. really great. Because mm -hmm. not everyone yes. would. A lot of people say yep. it's a tangled branch, right? Ooh, that's a thing too. Yeah. <laughs> Rianne. <laughs> sure. Hilla writes, Dear TWIV team, thank you for such a wonderful and informative podcast. I am a paramedic by profession, and this pandemic caught me working offshore with a crew of 53 on an 89-meter four-deck marine vessel back in February, though not yet called pandemic then. Last week of February, I began searching for the best methods of controlling the spread of infection on board, as I wasn't convinced, to say the least, that hand-washing supplemented by coughing into an elbow and sneezing into a tissue as advocated for by maritime companies, were adequate means to curb the spread of infection on board a closed air-conditioned vessel where physical distancing is impossible in most cases, especially given previous examples from cruise liners and their rates of infection. Long story short, despite initial WHO, NHS, and CDC discouraging this, Face mask wearing was an educated guess at that point that I took after reviewing various articles written in the aftermath of the SARS outbreak in 2003, supplemented by my past exposure to the social practice of face mask wearing in Japan. Contrary to what I found many believe is in fact an act of consideration towards the healthy by those who wear a mask when sick. I have already implemented this with my crew when arriving back with post-travel sniffles in the past. When finding it difficult to source single-use masks, I began hunting for some worthwhile study of fa fabric-grade masks. I have attached the article below for your critical view, best I could find, and he gives a link. While not perfect, it was useful in guiding the choice of fabric-made masks, and I hope you can benefit from it too. For completing the picture of mask wearing as proactive measure in attempt to curb the spread of infection, a very helpful piece was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He gives a link. The replicable viral analysis by the German group was something you looked into on TWIV episode 601, Das Coronavirus. Topped by the group's indication of the week-long period of replicable virus shedding in mildly symptomatic patients, and later the other studies that confirmed transmission of infection from pre-symptomatic hosts have all been invaluable in putting together a plan. I guess I wish people would stop making mask wearing a political issue and would make the mental link between use of condoms to prevent STD spread, hosts definitely not always symptomatic, and the use of face masks in preventing the spread of a respiratory-borne illness. Hosts are, as, are now very clear, definitely not always asymptomatic in the case of COVID-19. Symptomatic. Symptomatic. Not asymptomatic. Yeah, symptomatic. Stay healthy so we can all enjoy more of this unique fountain of knowledge. Sincerely, Hilla. I think this is great. She really reasoned through this early yeah. on. And Good the, analogy. And the analogy with STTs are great. And I completely agree. Uh, so I, I wish, you know, as, as Alan said, we should have done this very early in January. 
and said, this is what we had to do. Like so many things we should have done very early. <laughs> could have, I mean, the, could have. it is, I, I understand the whole back and forth about masks and the data. And, and when we're talking about masks, we're, we're talking about the improvised pieces of cloth that people can actually get rather than properly fitted in 95s on trained personnel. Um, and the, the data, I mean, just not that many studies have really been done at the public health level, and that's a problem when you're making recommendations in a crisis. Um, but the the cost of implementation is so low that we we're pretty sure this has some benefit, and everybody's got some piece of cloth around they can put on, and so do it. You know, it's it's a really simple thing, and it's turning out now that this is probably helping, you know, and it's um, the the only concern I've ever had with it is that it could lead to risk compensation. And I see some of that. This is a well-documented human behavior where people reduce a risk in one way and that leads them to compensate by increasing risks in other ways. The best, best known or one of the best known um, examples of that is that when you uh, mandate seatbelt use, people drive faster. Um, so mandating mask use, I mean, yes, there is some risk that people will say, oh, I'm wearing a mask. I'm bulletproof. I can stand two feet away from somebody now. Um, and, and I see some of that. Um, but overall, you know, it's not a political issue. Wear the mask for the sake of everybody around you. Um, and if we all do this, that's probably going to help. And by the way, this paper is, it's one of the many physical particulate type studies. Um, but they, the interesting thing they found was that two layers of cloth, especially if they're different cloths is especially good. Um, so, you know, fold the bandana at least, or, or have a layer of, of two different cloths. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I wish this had not become a political issue, but apparently everything does now. Well, uh, I would want to say something about this because she makes a, a wonderful analogy between wearing a condom and preventing sexually transmitted diseases. And I have inside information on this because our dean of uh, public health, Alan Rosenfield, was one of the uh, international or global advocates for the use of condoms. So why would you have to become an advocate for that if you could simply state that if you wear a condom, you can prevent the spread of a sexually transmitted disease like syphilis or gonorrhea or AIDS for that matter, HIV AIDS. And the, the socially responsible people do wear them and the socially irresponsible people do not. Well, it's a complicated and, issue, Dixon. First of all, the church, the Catholic church didn't want condom use for many years. No, I remember years. that. Yeah, I right? remember. Finally, they turned. And then in some countries, it's simply socially unacceptable, right? It differs from our culture. So yeah, that's and right. So un- un- unfortunately, so Alan, I have to now socially distance myself from the, physically, uh, from the TWIV physically. episode. <laughs> um, phys- physically distance myself from the TWIV episode. Okay. Um, Thank so. you, Alan. Alan Dove uh, yes. at uh, turbidplaque.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks so much, Alan. See you next Thank week. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Yep. Bye. Take Good care. to see you, Alan. Bye bye. Well, uh, is, Alan, I really uh, like Alan, the data here. This is really interesting data from this paper. Which one? The Nature paper? The ACS Nano paper. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Looking at uh, the filtration efficiency of common fabrics. Oh, good. Uh, what is the winner? Um, so it looks like cotton quilt um, huh. is very good. Is In fact, seems to be in a similar range with the N95. But then the other thing that's really good is cotton and chiffon com- uh, combined. So two layers. A double layer, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's for me. I love chiffon. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what it is, but I like it. It's so gentle to my face. <laughs> it looks good. Yeah, this is great. Hey, these are particles they're measuring. They're not measuring viruses. They're measuring particles. Right, they're but measuring that's, particles. That's what's coming out of your uh, nose and mouth for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, Dixon, you're next. Al writes, dear Twiv, exclamation point. I have an IgG and IgM deficiency. I infuse subcutaneously with antibodies every other week. I am 72 and in reasonably good health. I have not had an infection, including colds, since infusing for the past five years. I used to experience bronchitis four or five times a year previously. I live in North Florida near Tallahassee in a county that currently has had 42 cases. 
I have been very prudent about physical distancing and masking. Two questions. What, if any, impact would the infusions have on the severity of COVID-19? As I get new shipments of the antibodies for infusions, what are the chances I may get doses which include SARS-CoV-2 antibodies? I listen to TWIV frequently and understand about 33%, but nonetheless enjoy the discussions, Al. Hmm. Well, Brian, well, just getting infusions wouldn't help in general, right? It, it wouldn't help in general. Um, I don't know enough about um, where the antibodies are coming from in terms of the donors. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine he's getting some antibodies uh, against a variety of things with those infusions each week or every other week. Um, but I don't know who the donors are to know things like what your chances are of getting something with SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. That would be the, the main way this could help. So we have a lot of studies going on out there yeah. about the use of uh, Convalescent COVID curing. antibodies as a, as a, as a curative. What are the, what's the status for some of those studies? They're all, they're all ongoing. The, the recovery trial, for example, has convalescence here. They're all ongoing, so we'll know at some point. I don't know when. Um, but this gentleman wants to know if, if these antibodies would make it way into his sera. And so exactly. the, the way these are done is they are made all, they're made from donors who, in some cases, are immunized with vaccines to give specific antibodies, for example, polio antibodies, if they're not present. And so they, they're titrated, too. They want to make sure the antibodies are present. Otherwise, you're going to be deficient oh. in something, and you can get that infection. So oh. I, I, I assume at some point. So right now, I think the population level of these antibodies is low because not many people have been infected, right? So I, I just don't know. Maybe they're grabbing up all the sera from convalescent patients for these trials, or and I, I don't know at what point it might make its way into this. It's a really good question. Um, but uh, when it does, you yes, you would, in theory, if you infuse every other week, these would be protecting you. Yeah. Well, and if, exactly. well, that's if the studies show that. That's right. So they haven't done that yet, but we're working on it. We are working on it. All right. Alan is gone. So that brings us to me. Henry writes, hi, all of you Twivers. The COVID-19 lockdown has forced me to learn more than I ever Wanted to know about viruses. Thank you, Twiv. Um, yeah, but I'm, I think now you realize you need to know this, right? My background is in biology, but electrical engineering and computer science. I did a brief sprint <laughs> stint with the U.S. Public Health Service many decades ago working on kitchen microwave oven leaks and computer analyses of radioactive milk. Twiv has provided many of us non-biologists with incredibly helpful and accurate information during this information drought about coronaviruses. However, I have a serious bone to pick with Twivers regarding government surveillance via smartphone apps and contact tracing. You talk about wanting to take politics out of public health. You wonder why people don't trust their governments to provide services like contact tracing and safe vaccinations. Here are a few perfect examples of why that trust doesn't exist. The Tuskegee study of syphilis in 1932 to 72, University of Cincinnati Radiation Experiments, 1960 to 71. Edward Snowden revelation. The Obama, uh, excuse me, Obama Biden reelection campaign slogan in 2012. Bin Laden is dead and General Motors is alive. Uh, their stunt to kill Bin Laden had a cost in destroying public trust in, in uh, public health workers. Um, as you know, that they were saying we, were, we need blood for um, screening purposes, but they really wanted to get to see where he was, yeah, or his family. Um, and so he goes on and talks about that. All right, so, and then he gives a, an article on uh, how the CIA's fake vaccination campaign uh, endangers us all. The U.S. was wrong to use health workers to target bin Laden. Uh, P.S., my family and Dr. Albert Sabin knew each other. We were, all went to the same schools while growing up in Cincinnati in the 60s. Wow. <laughs> he, he is a... Uh, an MIT BS, MIT MS, and an MIT PhD. And he um, is a skeptical Democrat in Santa Barbara, California. And finally, PPS to fellow rower Rich Condon. I'm the 2019 World Indoor Rowing Champion in the 70 to 74 age group. Wow. Okay. Cool. We appreciate your, your thoughts. You were talking about wanting to take politics out of public health. 
Yeah, it's hard. I understand that because the politicians keep screwing it up, doing things like this. I agree it was not good to do a, a, a vaccine screen to find bin Laden's family. I totally agree with that. I think we talked about it at the time. We did. Yeah, and, and um, it is correct to talk or about the fact not. that there are things like the Tuskegee study that you know are not um, good examples and have certainly led a number of people to have less trust in public health. And um, hopefully we can reduce the number of such uh, things because those are not right to be done. Yeah, well, another thing about public health is that most people are not aware of the services that they're receiving. It's, it's, it's totally off the grid, so to speak. You know, water purification, food inspection, those sorts of things. So, unless people know what public health is to begin with, uh, they'll have a very um, mixed opinion as to whether it functions mm -hmm. properly or not. Right. And uh, they only hear about the things where when it goes wrong. They don't hear about it where it functions properly. That's right. That, that's yeah. that's really. I, I would like to always kind of think about, at least in terms of the, the functions and the, the money spent, the, the military and how people understand the need for that, and then the much less resource and understanding sure, there are right. for public health. That's right. And as Vincent has said, we would hope that after this, people would become aware of it and there would be a better situation for public health going forward, but we're not optimistic. It's, it's remarkable that you should point that out, Kathy, because if we spent as much on public health as we did on defense, uh, we'd be the healthiest country in the whole world. <laughs> I would argue that the public health is as important as a military defense. Much more. Oh, yeah. Oh, right? yeah. It's more, more, more. Much more important. More. Yeah, we spend much more on the military than on public health. Yes, billion. Kathy, you are next. Judy writes, hi, TWIV team. I'm a retired pediatrician and a recent convert to your show, which I love listening to. I learn something new every time. On a couple of recent shows, you've discussed the question of why children seem less susceptible than adults to infection with SARS-CoV-2. Last month, the Journal of American Medical Association published an article and accompanying editorial suggesting that young children have fewer ACE2 receptors in their nasal epithelium than do adults, and that this might be a partial explanation for their apparent resistance to infection. I thought you'd find it interesting and might even discuss it on a future show. I'd like to hear your take on the idea. And here's the link. Keep up the good work, educating so many of us, and thanks. So I haven't had a chance to look at this JAMA article. Is it a fact or is it speculation that so they, children they, have different they, they ACE2? Did, they did single cell RNA sequencing, right? And you find lower levels of RNA. So first of all, it's not protein, it's just it's an RNA analysis. So we don't know if actually the protein receptors differ at all. And even if they do, we don't know if that makes a difference in susceptibility. I don't think the experiments have ever been, I think we talked about this uh, in the smoking, the cigarette smoking story we talked about where it induces ACE2 RNA, but we don't know if that translates into protein and whether it translates into more uh, infection or not. So I think it's just, interesting but and maybe someone is is working on it but frankly i don't think this would explain the difference i think it's some other it's likely an immune based difference uh but you know i guess it could be but right now we have no idea absolutely no idea more to be examined right yeah brianne you're next we'll just finish this one round and tim writes hello twiv folks thanks for all of your work especially as of late with regard to the question's claims about lower transmission during warmer weather months and the current spike in warm weather states here in the U.S., I wonder if air conditioning might be related. I currently live near Boston, where we are closed up in the winter and open window and outside in the summer. But I grew up in Florida where it's just the opposite. Mm. Summer is the time of year when Floridians tend to cluster inside, sharing the same air conditioned air. It might be a small effect compared to the overall transmission wave, but it would be interesting if a correlation or not could be teased out somehow. Thanks, Tim. I think that makes sense. I think the more people are indoors, more tra we know it, that's where the transmission occurs, right? I, I think yeah. the spike didn't come up in Florida until they opened up the beaches and bars. So that's an outdoor thing. Um, yeah. and uh, Well, bars you know, are not, right? Well, it, well, yeah, 
Depends on the bar. I'm, I'm not sure that we know enough about differences in respiratory illness between warm weather states and cold weather states, but some of the hot spots are not going to be uh, limited to the Southern states. For example, I know that mm. there was a bar in East Lansing that uh, as of yesterday had 42 uh, COVID positive individuals yeah. connected with it. So, yeah, I mean, I think being, I think being indoor, I've seen, photos of people in bars right next to each other without face masks. And that's a perfect scenario. And they're sitting there for many hours, right? Exactly. Talking mm -hmm. and drinking. Whereas on the beach, I think it's, it's less likely. So I do think the indoor uh, situation is a problem. I, I do too. And I think that um, I hope that people understand that and think about the fact that if they, you know, really need to do something social, that they maybe are outdoors and physically distant from people instead of indoors, because it, it does seem to me like that would be a big difference. I mean, I think, I mean, all these photos I've seen, nobody's wearing face masks at all indoors right. and they're there for a long time and they're young. So they're not even going to know that they're infected and they're pr bringing virus all over the place. And that's the problem that right. we have here because they do not, they are asymptomatic. Uh, one more from Dixon. Jerry writes, hello, Twiv Meisters. On this episode, both Vincent and Rich agreed that far down the road, COVID-19 would be similar to the flu and that a yearly vaccine would be the norm. However, you both also agreed, I think, that the best would be if no vaccine were needed. My question is, are you suggesting that one, the virus would disappear? Probably not, I would think. Or two, that herd immunity of 70% of the world's population being infected would handle uh, to prevent the virus from becoming a lifelong scourge. Thanks for keeping me updated on all things viral. What do you say that, Vincent? Well, I don't think it's similar. I'm not sure we said that. It's not would not be similar to flu in that a yearly vaccine would be the norm. I, I think that once we once this virus has gone through this first set of people, it will become like a seasonal coronavirus, a common cold corona. And cause mild infections. You'll get infected as a child. You won't get sick. And then you'll get infected often as you age, but it will be mild or asymptomatic, right? So you won't even need a vaccine. The virus is not going to disappear. This, is, this virus is with us forever, as are the other four common cold coronas. So that's what I think is not disappearing. And at some point, you know, you'll be infected at a young age and that'll be it. No more disease the rest of your life. That's, You're not hoping that uh, mutationally speaking, no, no. it'll lose its no. It's not going to lose vitality, so to speak. No, no, no. It's not. It's going to be. It's going to be uh, population immunity that controls the severity of the infection. That's it, what Ralph Barrick said on the first time we had him on. He said, "This is what happens with the common colds. This is what I think happens. I think that makes perfect sense." Um, okay. So that's what we. That's what I think. I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a yearly vaccine. And it's, in a way. I don't know if this will happen, but I think we won't need this vaccine any longer in, in, I don't know, five years, because everyone will get immunized in their first 10 years of life by infection, and the kids don't get very sick from these things. But we'll see. A, Wouldn't it be interesting you if you me, don't? Though. No, <laughs> we'll but still what, be here. No, no, no. We, we, we're going to get immunized either by infection, hopefully not, but or by vaccination, and that'll yep. be it. Then after that, if we do get infected again, we're not going to get serious disease. That's what I think. That's what Ralph Barrick thinks. I think I would temper it and say that the vast majority of people are not going to get serious disease, but I, I don't know that even with the common cold coronaviruses, can we, can we say that it's never uh, lethal or, I mean, it's not, I, I guess I'm I just worried about being absolute. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. there probably are comorbidities where common Maybe. cold is much yeah, more yeah, problematic I, and that could happen here too. Probably, but the vast majority, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Kathy is uh, absolute averse, but I love being absolute. <laughs> and averse. Sis dramatic. <laughs> but yes, you are absolute. That's why we have Kathy here to, to uh, um, what's the word? To temper. Temper. temper us. To mollify. To mollify. temper my absolutism. <laughs> All right. That is TWIV 632 microbe.tv slash TWIV. What, what will you get there? The show notes. What's that? You don't know by now? That's where all the letters are, all the links to the papers we talk about. Twiv at microbe.tv if you want to send in a question or comment. 
And if you like what we do, we'd love your financial support. We thank all of you who are supporting us so far. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmier, trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. It was great. Stay healthy. Try my best. Brian you Bar- too, by the way. I thank you. I will. Brianne yeah. Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.